Chapter 631 The Truth Mrs. Stewart became even more infuriated when she heard this. She clutched her chest, unable to speak. Helen was just crying her eyes out next to her. Her father was not at home, so the two women from the Stewarts were obviously suppressed in momentum. When Nora was about to take a step forward, Jessica, who was next to her, stepped forward abruptly and said loudly, Mrs. Livingstone, now that's not very nice. What do you mean Thomas didn't cheat? Is the child in her belly not Thomas's? Did Thomas not have sexual relations with another woman while he is married? Mrs. Livingstone choked at once. Jessica went on. My little sister certainly hasn't given birth to any children, but are women mere baby-making tools? Are you saying that the Livingstones and the Stewarts' union was solely for the purpose of having children? If so, then why didn't you just approach surrogate mothers instead? What is the point of having Helen there? Besides, do you have any medical evidence to prove that my little sister is infertile? This is complete sophistry. If you cannot produce a medical report, then I will sue you for slander. Jessica was very aggressive, much like a hen protecting her chicks. She stood in front of her mother and Helen and blocked them from Mrs. Livingstone. Mrs. Livingstone seemed a little afraid of Jessica. She subconsciously stepped back and said, no matter what, they have to get a divorce. Divorce. Sure, but you have to give my little sister the compensation she deserves. The Stewarts are not to be trifled with either. After snapping back at Mrs. Livingstone furiously, Jessica looked at Helen and said, what is the use of crying when your husband has already cheated on you? Times have changed, can't you even stand up for yourself? Helen, I'm telling you, you have to divorce him. Are you planning on keeping that man so that he can bring back more illegitimate children? The sobbing Helen nodded. I will do as you say, Jessica. She was thoroughly heartbroken. When she got married, everyone had said that she was really blessed to be able to marry into the Livingstones. Given how close a relationship the Livingstones and the Hunts shared, she would surely welcome a good life in the future. But who knew that Thomas would actually be such an insect? Mrs. Livingstone sneered, Jessica, what do you mean by that? We Livingstones are decent people, we are not people who indulge in casual relationships. We won't just want any random woman. Jessica sneered, oh, really? Considering how you can accept even someone like Cecilia, the Livingstones, standards for women are really too low. Mrs. Livingstone wanted to continue the argument about Cecilia, but she suddenly realized something. She sneered, the problem is not about Cecilia right now. Rather, it's about Helen's infertility. On top of that, she even conspired with a doctor to shift the blame onto my son. What a pity for her, though, because Cecilia is pregnant, which just so happens to clear my son's name. On the other hand, even though it has been three years since Helen married into the Livingstones, she hasn't gotten pregnant even once, so the problem must lie with her. Since that's the case, then this marriage should be annulled. When the two of them got engaged back then, we had agreed that whoever does something wrong after marriage would receive a smaller portion of the joint financial assets. Therefore, Helen can only leave the Livingstones penniless. Cecilia was pregnant. The timing was simply too sensitive. Should news of it spread, everyone would surely know that Thomas had cheated on his wife. If that happened, he would no longer be able to hold his head up high in the circle of the wealthy in New York. That was why Mrs. Livingstone had come over to make a scene. Firstly, it was because a married couple's joint property was indeed difficult to divide. Secondly, it was because she mustn't allow her son to be known as someone who had mistreated his ex-wife. She mustn't allow her son to become the main reason for the marriage's failure. Jessica let out a contemptuous laugh. Suddenly, she lowered her eyes and said, we are all respectable people that don't wish to embarrass ourselves. The Stewarts will not ask the Livingstones for even a single cent more than what should be given. However, alimony must be given because you made Helen quit her job after she married Thomas. Because of that, she now has a three-year unemployment gap in her career. Mrs. Livingstone sneered, then what about the money that the Livingstones gave the Stewarts when they got married back then? The Livingstones had given them a large sum of money as a wedding gift. By saying that, Mrs. Livingstone was demanding even that sum of money back, even though they had given it to them as a gift. 
Jessica was about to speak when Helen suddenly looked at Thomas. Thomas, what is the meaning of this? Thomas curled his lips disdainfully and replied, My mother's will is also mine. I've found you really boring since a long time ago. You don't even move at all in bed. It was really no fun at all. Helen turned paler. At last, she lowered her head and said, Fine, fine, I will return you all that money the Livingstones gave us. A shocked Jessica looked at her abruptly. Helen, what kind of nonsense are you saying? If they returned that money, what would outsiders think? Why didn't they take any money from the Livingstones during the divorce? But even gave them money instead. Of course, it was because they had done something wrong. People often didn't care about the details, they only looked at the results. Neither would they think that Helen was being generous. Instead, they would definitely think that Helen must have done something to let the Livingstones down. Helen, however, shook her head. Jessica, I just want to be divorced as soon as possible. She didn't want to be entangled with him any further. She would just cut the Gordian knot. This way, she would be able to go home and live a carefree life. Seemingly having understood the meaning behind her words, Jessica said nothing more. Mrs. Livingstone sneered, Helen, are you feeling guilty? Well, that makes sense. We won't hold you accountable for wasting my son's time either. We'll just let the matter go at that. I just hope that you won't bother my son. After that, Mrs. Livingstone, Thomas, and Helen settled on the time and date that they would come over to take the money, as well as when they would sign the divorce papers. After making all the arrangements, before the two left, Mrs. Livingstone emphasized once more, Helen, the Livingstones won't hold it against you and your family this time. But remember this, the divorce is because of your infertility. It has nothing to do with the Livingstones. Thomas nodded. Yes, that's right. Remember this, it's I, Thomas, who doesn't want you anymore. After saying that, Mrs. Livingstone and Thomas left. After they left, Helen squatted on the floor and suddenly burst into racking sobs. She clutched her head and murmured, I am so useless. Why couldn't I just get pregnant? Why, I'm so useless. Only then did Nora finally take a step forward. She said, it's not your fault. Chapter 632 The Truth About Xander Yale Nora had hidden herself in the corner after she entered just now and had refrained from interfering with their family affairs. Therefore, the few of them hadn't noticed her in the heated argument. When she spoke, Helen finally looked up in a daze. At the sight of Nora, she wiped her tears and stood up. Ms. Smith, why are you here? Before Nora could speak, Jessica asked, Ms. Smith, what did you mean by that? Nora sighed silently. Helen was simply too much of a pushover. Being ladylike and soft-spoken were positive traits, gentleness was also part of a person's character. However, being excessively weak and delicate would only encourage others to bully one even more. However, Jessica seemed different. She was more straightforward and the questions she asked hit the crux of the matter. Nora didn't want to comfort or persuade them about anything. She merely said, Thomas is not the father of Cecilia's child. As soon as she said that, the people in the room were dumbfounded. Jessica was stunned. She said, he isn't. If he isn't, then what is Thomas doing? Also, why do you say that? Do you have any evidence? Jessica's thought process was clear. Helen, however, was still looking at her in a daze. Nora cast her eyes down. I checked his pulse the other time, he does indeed have asthenospermia. On top of that, his condition is very serious. Therefore, it stands to reason that Thomas will not be able to have children. However, he said that Cecilia is pregnant and that they only found out about the pregnancy today. So I went to check Cecilia's pregnancy records. I found that her HCG levels are relatively high. Those numbers are impossible in a patient who is only a month pregnant. In addition, I also found out that Cecilia has prior medical records from more than one month ago. At that time, they had already diagnosed that she was more than a month pregnant. From this, we can conclude that she should already be three months pregnant by now. Helen, where was Thomas three months ago? A dazed Helen replied, Thomas was in France three months ago. A project over there had run into problems. As it was relatively tricky, he stayed there for nearly a month. 
At this point, Helen spoke again. Did he go to France with Cecilia? She seemed astounded. But as soon as she said that, Jessica smacked her hard on the head and said, Helen Stewart, what's wrong with you? What kind of situation do you think you're in right now? Yet you're still being jealous. Is there anything about that man that's worth being jealous? If you continue to be like this, I will really look down on you. Don't you know that women should be independent? If even you look down on yourself, then how can you make others value you? However, Helen said in tears, I'm not looking down on myself. But it's true that I was married for three years, yet I didn't get pregnant. Jessica was exasperated. She yelled furiously, Hansel Lloyd's wife also didn't have any children even after so many years of marriage, and they adopted a child in the end. But look at her, when has she ever felt inferior about it? When has she ever not carried herself graciously? Do you know why? Helen nodded. It's because she is good at managing the company. She is actually the one in charge of Lloyd's company. It was at this point that Helen finally suddenly understood. Her eyes reddened and she hung her head. You're right, Mrs. Lloyd can't reproduce, but the Lloyds have never dared to look down on her because of that. Neither has she ever felt inferior because of it, only when one becomes strong will they not be looked down upon. Seeing that she had finally understood, Jessica looked at Nora again. I saw Cecilia at an event two and a half months ago, she couldn't have gone out of the country with Thomas. Therefore, the child really isn't his. As soon as she said that, next to them, Mrs. Stewart, their mother, immediately banged the table and stood up. Since it is not his, then let's go over and tell them about it right away. We'll throw the evidence right in their faces. And see how they still have the cheek to demand a divorce. 2. 11. The room suddenly fell silent. Taken aback, Mrs. Stewart looked at the three of them. Jessica didn't pay any attention to Mrs. Stewart. Instead, she looked at Nora first and said, Ms. Smith, thank you so much for not revealing all of this the moment you stepped in. Nora merely smiled at her quietly. Mrs. Stewart, however, was puzzled. Why didn't she say it? If she had, we would have been able to slap both mother and son in the face just now. How nice would that have been? Jessica looked at Mrs. Stewart, who had the same personality as Helen, and felt rather helpless. Mom, what then? Mrs. Stewart replied, when they are sure that the problem lies with Thomas, they definitely won't dare to divorce Helen anymore. And since all of this is because of the Livingstones themselves, they will only keep Helen happy in the future. Jessica lowered her eyes. And then, what happens after that? Do you want Helen to stay by his side as he goes for medical treatment, and then let him do a return of the prodigal son? Mrs. Stewart choked. Girl, those words of yours sting too much. Jessica turned to Helen. She said, Helen, you have two options now. The first one, you go to the Livingstones immediately with the evidence and tell them the truth. You will then become the Livingstones, hero. Helen was taken aback. Jessica, however, stared at her and said, but I'll be clear about this if you do that, then you're no longer my sister. From then on, even if the Livingstones bully you, don't ever come back here and cry to us about it. Helen bit her lip. Mrs. Stewart became even more hesitant. She said, Jessica, it's better to demolish a temple than to destroy a marriage. If you do that. Mom. Jessica reprimanded her angrily. Have you really become muddle-headed from old age? Back then, we failed to ask around properly and find out what Thomas was really like before we allowed Helen to marry him. Now that we have finally seen his true colors, instead of making a quick escape, what are you people still staying in the hellhole for? Mrs. Stewart sighed. Never mind, I wash my hands off this. The world belongs to you youngsters now. I'm old now, so I don't understand anymore. Nora. She could finally see what was going on now. Jessica was the one in charge at the Stewarts, whereas the real mistress of the household didn't have any control over anything. She looked at Helen too, wanting to know her choice. Helen bit her lip and said, Jessica, Miss Smith. I've made up my mind I want a divorce. What should I do in the second option you proposed? Jessica clapped her on the shoulder. Now, that's my sister, all right. No matter the occasion, you must always have the courage to face your troubles. Us daughters of the Stuarts don't have to worry about remarrying at all.
Now that you have made up your mind, then it's time for us to set things up. Jessica said, we won't reveal the truth for the time being. Let's make use of the opportunity while the Livingstones are still willing to get a divorce to get all the divorce procedures done first. Otherwise, once the Livingstones know the truth, they will definitely refuse to divorce. The Livingstones are big and powerful, and even have the hunts backing them up. We won't be able to beat them in a direct confrontation. When that happens, it will be very hard for you to divorce him. After that, we will find an opportunity to let the cat out of the bag. I will also use the next few days to find Cecilia's adulterer. Her thought process was clear, and she also had the courage to shoulder responsibility. Then, she turned to Nora and said, but you'll probably have to suffer some injustice for the next few days as a result of this, Miss Smith. The Livingstones will definitely spread the news and say that the blame lies fully with the Stewarts. Nora raised her eyebrows and nodded. I understand. This was precisely the reason why she hadn't immediately brought up the matter about Cecilia when she came in and found that the Livingstones were discussing divorce matters. Jessica felt very bad about this. She said, I know the Livingstones very well. They don't want any blemishes on their reputation. Back then, when Helen was about to marry into the family, there wasn't any bad press about him out there. Even the matter about him impregnating someone when he was 20 years old was rumored to be the girl's plot against Thomas. We were fooled by them. She was about to say more when Nora's cell phone suddenly rang. She looked down and glanced at it it was an overseas number. Nora raised her eyebrows and gestured to Jessica that she was answering a call. Then, she went out and picked up the call. Caleb's voice came from the other end, Ms. Smith, I heard that Mr. Hunt has an illegitimate child. I'm calling to tell you the truth I've found out about Xander Yale. Chapter 633 The Truth, Ruth is not Xander's mother. Nora was taken aback. To be honest, as early as Truman had released Xander, she had wondered if Caleb knew anything. However, she hadn't taken the initiative to ask him. Caleb had returned to the mysterious organization with the sacred mission of the special department on his shoulders. She mustn't bother him with her personal affairs, lest Caleb's identity was exposed while investigating them. Thus, she had never asked him about it, planning to look into it herself. Besides, Lily was already comparing their DNA and would succeed sooner or later. It was just a matter of time. But unexpectedly, Caleb had taken the initiative to call her. A touch of gratitude rose from the bottom of Nora's heart, and she asked, what is the truth? Caleb's voice was very low obviously, he was making the call in secret. According to my investigations, that child has been hidden by Truman in the headquarters all this time, so I have never seen him before. But when Truman was talking with him on the phone, he accidentally let something slip. He told Xander to try his best to save his Aunt Ruth, but the child instead said, why? She didn't give birth to me nor has she ever taken care of me. Am I supposed to save her just because she is your sister? Truman then said, then at least make sure that she doesn't die. Xander agreed and then he said, don't worry, I won't give it away. At the very least, in my biological father's eyes, Aunt Ruth is my mother. Therefore, based on this, I would think that Ruth is not his mother. Nora cast her eyes down. To be honest, she had already guessed as much. Ruth and Xander's DNA match was only 20%. Even though Xander might have been injected with the gene serum, modifying his genes, it was still impossible for his DNA to change so drastically. Therefore, at the very least, it was impossible for Ruth to be his mother. Now that Caleb had confirmed it, they could get rid of Ruth first. Truman didn't seem to really care about whether his sister lived or not anyway. With that in mind, Nora thanked Caleb over the phone. Thanks. I'll treat you to dinner when you return. Okay. Caleb's voice became a lot more relaxed. After a brief silence, he suddenly said, Nora, Ms. Smith, can I call you that? Yes, you can. He had already done so anyway. Could she even say no? The corners of her lips spasmed a little. Then, she heard Caleb speak again. He said, Nora, I'm very sorry that I didn't keep Anthony in check back then, and ended up allowing him to humiliate you and annul the engagement. You have already apologized for that.
Caleb chuckled, his voice gentle and mellow. I'd like to apologize for it again. All right, then. Nora yawned. She sounded relaxed as she said, I've already forgiven the Greys. To be honest, she had never once hated the Greys. Although Anthony had looked down on her, ridiculed her, and mocked her all the time when she was fat, at that time, the only thing on her mind had been sleeping, so why would she take it to heart? She said into the phone, it sounds like your cough has become a little better. I made more medicine and wanted to give it to you, but I didn't expect you to leave early. Caleb laughed. A while later, he suggested, why don't you send it to me via International Express Mail, then? Nora raised her eyebrows and replied, sure. After hanging up the phone, Caleb, who was sitting alone in a luxuriously decorated room overseas, stared straight ahead of him. He suddenly murmured, I wonder if she'll visit me since I have given her the address. After all, he didn't have long to live anymore. He really wanted Nora to visit him before he died. Unfortunately, he was completely unaware that such indirect methods were totally ineffective on an insensitive lout like Nora. In the States, Nora didn't even take a look at the address. She forwarded it straight to Cheryl and told her to mail the medicine out. Then, she gave the stewards a heads up that she was leaving, and went back to the Smiths. As soon as she arrived at the Smiths, she received a text message from Justin, I heard about the incident with the Livingstones. Do you want me to give them a warning? A single word from Justin could scare the crap out of Thomas and his mother. When Nora saw his message, she called him right away. She asked, have you already given them a warning? The man's voice was very low. He chuckled and replied, no, not yet. Didn't I ask for your instructions just now? Nora liked that he didn't take the liberty to act on his own in everything he did. At the very least, if Justin had given the Livingstones a warning, Helen might not even be able to divorce him anymore. She smiled and said, Nah, you don't have to warn them about it. We already have a plan. But if I cause the Livingstones to be utterly disgraced, will you be put in a spot, Mr. Hunt? To be honest, he would indeed be very much put in a spot. After all, Mrs. Hunt would come crying to him. But since Nora had asked, then the answer could only be, no, it won't. Thomas was Mrs. Hunt's grandnephew. By right, now that Mrs. Hunt's immediate family members were gone, the people from Mrs. Livingstone's generation should be the only ones staying in contact with her. And once Mrs. Hunt was gone as well, the two families would no longer have any relations with each other. However, Mrs. Hunt cared for her maiden family, and on top of that, Thomas was always visiting. That was how he had forcibly made it look as if the two families shared a close relationship with each other. For Mrs. Hunt's sake, Justin was also willing to take care of the Livingstones a little. However, that was all just charity on his part. Since the Livingstones were blind enough to offend Nora, then he didn't need to care about such things anymore. Justin was very clear about who mattered and who he should keep dear. Nevertheless, he should still ask for credit where it was due. Justin said straightforwardly, even if grandma hits me with a bat, I still won't be put in a spot. Nora, come to think about it, it seemed like Justin also had it pretty tough being caught in between her and Mrs. Hunt. Fortunately, he still chose to stand firmly on her side. Satisfied, Nora uttered, yeah. Justin took the opportunity to make a request. He said, then are you still coming over to the hunts tomorrow? You were in such a hurry today that I didn't even have time to show you around, especially, I intend to turn my villa into our home after marriage. Do you want to give your opinion on the renovations? Nora thought for a while and replied, I only have one request. What? The bed has to be comfortable. Sue, Justin also knew that that was the only thing she would ask for. He chuckled and said, of course, it has to be comfortable. After all, if the bed is not sturdy enough, I'm afraid it won't be able to support the two of us when we, Nora. Weren't they chatting? Why was the man suddenly making innuendos? She rolled her eyes. While we do what? Don't think too much, I was talking about us fighting on it. Didn't you say it yourself, big sister? You'll beat me up every time you see me. Nora. She suddenly felt like her fists were itching. Tisk, big brother, I suddenly feel like married life won't be that boring anymore. We can spar every day. 
This way, we can even exercise a little. Justin, that wasn't the kind of exercise he wanted. He said, why don't you come over tomorrow and we make a pick for the master bedroom? Cherry and Pete haven't been to the hunts for really long too. All right, Nora agreed. She wondered what kind of sparks would fly among the three little fellows once Cherry and Pete met Xander. She raised her eyebrows and tried for a while to imagine the three of them together, but she simply couldn't. At last, she shook her head and said, by the way, Ruth is not Xander's mother. When Justin heard this, his pupils shrank. Are you sure? Yeah, Nora answered. The two chatted a little more before they hung up. Justin sat in the study and thought about what Nora had said just now. Suddenly, he got up and walked to the basement. He emitted bloodthirsty murderous intent all over. He had been worried that Ruth could really be Xander's mother, so he hadn't gotten rid of her. But now that he knew the truth, hey. He went downstairs. When he arrived at the basement, he found the butler standing guard at the door. When Justin walked over, he realized that Xander was also there. He was squatting on the ground and chatting with Ruth while facing her. Rather than saying that they were chatting, though, it was more like Xander was making fun of Ruth. The little fellow's chin was resting on his hands as he looked at Ruth and prattled away. However, what he said stunned Justin. Chapter 634 Are you? Are you worthy of it? The butler noticed Justin. When he was about to speak, Justin stopped him. He went up to the door and looked inside quietly. He narrowed his eyes, a look of scrutiny forming within. To be honest, fathers didn't have any resistance towards their children. This was especially in the case of people who'd had children before. Thus, even if Xander was a little devil who had been raised by Truman, and even if he had thrown the whole hunt manor into a tizzy after his arrival, Justin nevertheless still gradually went from finding the boy a stranger to feeling a bit soft-hearted towards him. But when he saw him sitting opposite Ruth, he still couldn't help but frown. The child did not understand the difference between good and evil, let alone what was right and what wasn't. In addition, what he did after he returned to the hunts had indeed angered him. Yet when he thought of how he might be the third child he had with Nora, he would relent again. In fact, he was actually worried about something. Should the child really be beyond hope, and should he be determined to take Truman and Ruth's side, then even if he must imprison him for a lifetime, he still mustn't allow him to hurt his loved ones. While he was contemplating, he saw Xander hand Ruth a carrot. He was telling her about the benefits of eating carrots. Carrots contain a lot of nutrition. They also contain carotene and anthocyanins. Eating three a day can lower one's cholesterol levels by 10 to 20 percent. It can also effectively prevent cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases, which is very important to the human body. He prattled on and on about the benefits of eating carrots, but Ruth became angry instead. She said, I told you, I want bread. I want rice. I want carbohydrates. Xander, I have already gone hungry for six days. If you continue like this, I will die. No, you won't. Carrots have nutrients, they will keep you alive, so don't worry about it. Also, even if you really are dying, I will find someone to save you. Xander spoke with a lot of confidence. Ruth. She was furious. She said, Xander, tell me, are you doing this just to take revenge on me? Because I made you eat carrots when you were younger. The opportunity has come to you now, hasn't it? But don't forget this, I will go back sooner or later. When I do, I will tell your father what you did. As for you, there will eventually come a day where you'll fall into my clutches again. A touch of contemplation flashed across Xander's eyes, but his expression remained amicable. He held his chin with his hands and said, What are you talking about? I don't understand. How can you not? You did it on purpose. When you were four years old, my brother entrusted you to me and told me to take care of you for a week. During that one week, all I fed you were carrots every day. You must be holding a grudge against me because of that. You little brat, I didn't expect you to still remember all that even though so much time has already gone by. How dare you do this to me? You must be sick of living. As Ruth spoke, she went forward to hit him. However, because she hadn't eaten for a long time, she was weak all over. The moment she moved a little, she fell straight onto the ground. 
Xander stood up in front of her and rubbed his nose. This subconscious action of his was actually exactly the same as Justin's. At the door, Justin froze when he heard their conversation and saw Xander's subconscious action. He had always been a little wary towards Xander. Thus, he had never liked this son of his since his return. Even if he did faintly feel a bit of fondness for him, he suppressed it at the bottom of his heart and kept it hidden. He'd thought that Truman must have treated Xander very well, which led to the development of his anarchical character, but never had he ever imagined that Xander had actually gone through all that. Giving a child nothing but carrots for seven days, just how exactly did Ruth have the heart to do something like that? He suddenly clenched his fists and stared fixedly into the interrogation room. Xander was standing there, staring at Ruth. After a while, he said, yeah, if my father hadn't returned in time, I might really have starved to death. Ruth yelled furiously, what nonsense are you talking about? You have everything in your room. There is fire, there are pots, and there are also rabbits. All you had to do was just eat those rabbits. Who told you to be so pretentious and say ridiculous things like the rabbits are your friends? You even gave the carrots to the rabbits. What a joke. Those rabbits are delicacies to humans. I really don't know who you're putting on that pretentious act for. My brother may pamper you and let you play with the rabbits, but I won't. You love your rabbits so much, don't you? Then let's see whether you can hold back from eating them when you're starved for weeks. Xander lowered his head. They are not food or animals. They are my friends. Ruth sneered and said in a low voice, so what even if they are? Didn't they get eaten anyway after they died? Ha ha ha. When my brother came back, he took you out and gave you a pot of meat, right? That was a pot of rabbit meat. And also your favorite number six a meat. Xander trembled a little. The thin little boy seemed to emanate a sense of loneliness and confusion. He stared at Ruth. Yeah, dad scolded you after that. I thought you would change, but unexpectedly, you instead killed number six the very next moment and even tricked me into eating it. Ruth smirked. Aren't rabbits delicious? I remember asking you how it tasted at the time, you said it was delicious. And then, what happened later on? Whenever your rabbits died, you would always choose to eat them. Hey, so is there anything wrong with what I did? Xander stared at her. Indeed, ever since that incident, he would eat his rabbits after they died. Because, if he didn't, then the rabbits would be taken away and used as specimens for more research. His friends wouldn't be able to rest in peace even after their deaths. If he ate them instead, then the rabbits would be safe. While Xander was thinking about it, the door to the room was suddenly pushed open. Justin strode in, his deep-set eyes staring straight at Ruth. There was murderous intent in his eyes. Ruth was shocked and intimidated by the look in his eyes. But right after that, she asked, Mr. Hunt, are you here to let me out? Justin's gaze became even colder. Yeah, I'll send you home. Ruth's eyes lit up. But the next moment, she instead heard Justin add, after all, one must eventually return to their roots. Ruth suddenly understood what he meant. Her eyes widened in fright and she shouted, why you're thinking of killing me? No, you can't do this to me. I'm Xander's mother. Xander had promised Truman that he would not expose her identity. This was the only thing that could protect her now. Unexpectedly, as soon as she said that, Justin said, oh, are you? Are you? Worthy of being his mother. Chapter 635 A Family of Five even an ordinary unrelated person wouldn't have been able to starve a four-year-old for a whole week. Even he, Justin, had never abused Xander after meeting the child, despite how much he hated Truman. Ruth was badly frightened when she heard Justin's words. She swallowed. W what are you saying? I am his mother. If you don't believe me, then ask Xander. Xander was standing at the side and looking at Justin in confusion. He didn't understand why Justin had suddenly come in, or why he was suddenly so angry. But he still thought of the instructions Truman had given him before he came to the States. He had told him to cooperate with Ruth. It would do as long as it didn't expose her identity. Therefore, after he came to the States, he had never once called Ruth, Aunt Ruth. Ruth's question at this moment was putting him in a spot, though. He didn't want to speak lies like Ruth was his mother. 
The little fellow in an internal struggle said, she. Shut up. Justin suddenly barked in a low voice. The man had a very powerful aura around him and he gave off a very oppressive feeling. In this small and dark basement, he was clearly the king of this world, dominating one's life and death. Those two words of his frightened Xander. Then, the man said in a low voice, where's the butler? Here, sir. Take Xander upstairs and put him to bed. Yes, sir. Without another word, the butler picked up Xander in his arms and walked out of the basement at once. For the first time, Xander became scared. Puzzled, he turned his head to the back and looked at Justin's back. The figure was obviously getting further and further away from him, but in his eyes, it was as if it was instead becoming bigger and bigger, this continued until the butler went out the door with him in his arms and then went upstairs. When he was sure that Xander had entered his room, Justin finally looked at Ruth. Then, he turned and shut the door to the basement. Ruth looked at him, a touch of despair suddenly welling up in her. She asked in trepidation, M. Mr. Hunt, what, what are you doing? Sending you home. The terrible screams from the basement were all blocked by the soundproofed walls. In the guest room upstairs, Xander lay on the bed with his eyes closed. However, he pressed his ears hard against the bed and carefully tried to listen to the sounds downstairs, but he simply could not hear anything. The little fellow couldn't help but roll over. Then, he opened his eyes. Had the tyrant suddenly become angry just now because of him? Surely not. The tyrant obviously didn't like him. Truman had also said that the tyrant was in love with a woman. He would not like him for the sake of that woman too. Therefore, the tyrant disliked him very much. But if that was the case, then why was the tyrant punishing Aunt Ruth? Xander couldn't figure it out, so he decided not to think about it anymore. That night, Xander had another nightmare. In the nightmare, a big tiger kept chasing him and said that it wanted to eat him and his rabbits. He ran and ran, but he simply couldn't keep running anymore. Just when he thought he was going to be eaten, a big and tall figure suddenly appeared in front of him. He couldn't see the tall figure's face because his back was to him, but for some strange reason, in the dream, he found the figure very reliable, and he gave him a strong sense of security. Early the next morning, Nora brought Pete and Cherry to the hunt's manor. As soon as they entered, Cherry dived into Justin's arms like a butterfly. In her young and tender voice, she shouted, Daddy, Daddy. Did you miss me? Justin caught the little girl and picked her up. Then, he replied, Yes, I did. Cherry immediately gave him a kiss on the forehead. I missed you too. I even dreamed of you. Really? Justin sounded pleasantly surprised. What did you dream? Cherry started to talk about her dream. Pete followed beside the two of them with a disdainful look, his expression as though he had nothing to live for anymore. At this moment, Justin's large hand suddenly landed on his head and ruffled his hair. Pete immediately lowered his head and avoided his hand. He said, Ty, Daddy, you mustn't touch a child's head. Otherwise, they will become stupid. But Justin instead replied, well, you have a high IQ anyway, so it's okay even if you become a little stupid. Justin then looked at the back. Nora dragged her feet and yawned as she walked behind the three of them. Obviously, she hadn't slept enough yet. He asked, what time did you sleep last night? Nora rolled her eyes. It's because I got up too early today. Had she woken up early so that she could come over to meet him? Justin smiled. He suddenly paused for half a step. When Nora walked up to him, he said, I've taken care of Ruth. Taken care of her. Nora was a little surprised. What did you do to her? The special department still has their eyes on Ruth and is planning to look for clues through her. Justin asked, if Ruth really knew anything integral to the organization, do you think someone like Truman would have allowed her to come to the States? Nora also felt that Truman didn't care about Ruth at all. Hearing this, she uttered an, oh, and didn't bother any further with the topic. She said, just don't give the special department anything to use against you. Of course not. I don't do anything illegal. Justin said, I only sent her home. Ruth's home was located abroad. It had nothing to do with him if she was killed in a gun robbery outside the country. Nora, she understood now. She raised her head and glanced upstairs. 
Then, she looked at Cherry and Pete and asked, where is Xander? She wondered what kind of scene the three little fellows would make. Chapter 636 Good News Upon hearing what she said, Justin suddenly said, I'm starting to feel more and more like Xander is our son. Nora was taken aback. How so? Justin suddenly smiled. He went to bed very early last night, but he is still asleep even now, and he always looks like he doesn't get enough sleep. Did he inherit that from you? The corners of Nora's lips spasmed. In the bedroom upstairs, Xander had actually already woken up a long time ago. In fact, he was even hiding behind the curtain at the windowsill and looking down at the lower floor. When Justin picked up Cherry, a lump had even formed in his throat. For a moment, he really wanted to throw Cherry onto the floor. But when he thought of how they might be Cherry and Pete, the friends whom he had gotten to know through the internet, he resisted the urge to do so. That woman had given birth to Cherry and Pete. The four of them were a family, whereas he, Xander, was an extra. Therefore, he wasn't going to join them. Ha! The proud Xander continued hiding upstairs. He closed his eyes and continued pretending that he was asleep. Xander was asleep, so after the family of four entered the living room, Nora sat on the sofa, closed her eyes, and rested. Cherry was in Justin's arms. She was showing him her ranking in her game on her cell phone. She said, Daddy, look. I have already achieved 100 stars in the game. Aren't I amazing? Justin nodded. Yup, Cherry is the best. Cherry grinned happily at the praise. Next to them, Pete couldn't help sighing. Even if you stick your foot in his face, he would still say it smells nice. Cherry, she retorted indignantly, but my feet do smell nice. Why would a little princess's feet possibly stink? Pete, the few of them engaged one another in a rather vapid conversation. A while later, when Justin was about to invite Nora upstairs to pick a room for their master bedroom after marriage, footsteps suddenly came from the door. Then, with the help of the housekeeper, an unsteady Mrs. Hunt walked in. As soon as she entered, her gaze fell on Nora. She said, I heard that Pete is back, so I came over to have a look. So, Miss Smith is also here. Nora opened her eyes, raised her eyebrows, and ignored her. The old lady walked up to Pete. Pete, come over to Great Grandma and let me see if you've lost weight. How have you been? Have you been healthy? Have you been eating well? Did the Smiths mistreat you? By saying such things in front of Nora, Mrs. Hunt was deliberately trying to anger her. Unfortunately, she found that Nora was not affected by her questions in the least. Pete also answered earnestly, No, the Smiths are great too. Grandpa treats me very well. Seeing that Nora was still ignoring her, Mrs. Hunt suddenly found all this rather boring. Thus, she stopped trying to be mean and sat on the sofa instead. She looked at Nora and said, Ms. Smith, I have already given the Livingstones instructions not to spread the news about your misdiagnosis. Nora raised her eyebrows when she heard this. What was she trying to say by that? While she was thinking about it, Mrs. Hunt went on. I initially thought that your medical skills must be very impressive since you are Dr. Zabe's disciple, but you ultimately still have too little experience in comparison with him. Only the elderly are good at alternative medicine. It's different from modern medicine. She then said, originally, Thomas thought you were in collusion with Helen, so he was hell-bent on publicizing the matter. I was the one who stopped him. After saying that, she looked at Nora. She'd thought that Nora would thank her for it, but unexpectedly, the woman's attitude towards her was actually still as half-hearted as ever. Mrs. Hunt became rather angry at once. Ms. Smith, I know you don't care about such things, after all, your reputation is already in tatters, but you still have to pay more attention to it in the future. After all, even if you don't care about it, the hunts do. As soon as she said that, Justin cast his eyes down and said, on the contrary, I think these things about fame and status aren't very important. Haven't I also been notorious all these years? How has that affected the hunts? Upon being talked back right to her face, Mrs. Hunt found herself at a loss for words. A short while later, she finally stood and said, Fine, it's this old lady here who was being too meddlesome. Thomas is a loudmouth. 
I dare say that if I tell them that I'm washing my hands off this matter, news of Norris' misdiagnosis will definitely become the talk of the city tomorrow. Coyle, Justin raised his eyebrows. Oh, it's okay. Nora still looked as though she wasn't intending to speak. Mrs. Hunt was infuriated. Fine, fine. Since all of you are taking that attitude, then I'll get someone to tell them about it right away. As she spoke, she started walking out. When she reached the door, Nora suddenly said, Mrs. Hunt. Mrs. Hunt stopped and looked over. As expected, Nora must not want to be embarrassed either, right? So, was she giving in now? But as soon as the thought flashed through her mind, she instead heard Nora ask, when are the Livingstones planning to get the divorce done? Mrs. Hunt. She was furious. I just received news that they have already gone to the court. Looking at the time, the two of them should be out by now. Oh, Nora raised her eyebrows when she heard this. Then, she chuckled and said, In that case, I also have a piece of good news here to celebrate with you. Mrs. Hunt. Mrs. Hunt was taken aback. What's the good news? Chapter 637 Thomas the Huge Cuckold. Nora cast her cat-like eyes down and slowly said, I have never made any mistakes in my diagnoses. Mrs. Hunt frowned. She clenched her jaw. Hey, are you trying to say that your diagnosis of Thomas is correct? Nora raised her eyebrows and said nothing. Mrs. Hunt balled up her fists. As someone who had experienced so many things in life, she had actually already had her own suspicions when Thomas said that Cecilia was pregnant. She had even personally brought it up to the Livingstones. At that time, Mrs. Livingstone and Thomas had clearly promised that they would investigate it properly. Since they had proceeded with the divorce, she thought that it was because Thomas had already made sure that the problem didn't lie with him, or that he had confirmed that the child in Cecilia's belly was his. But judging from how confident Nora looked, she couldn't help but think of the Zabe Corporation's calming pills that Nora had made. Dr. Zabe was the only person in the world who could make those pills, but he had long since become bedridden and unable to make medicine anymore. Nora was the one and only disciple whom Dr. Zabe had personally accepted. When Mrs. Hunt thought of this, she suddenly became flustered. She hurriedly walked out with the help of the housekeeper. Seeing her staggering back, the corners of Nora's lips lifted into a smile. Justin looked at the cheeky smile on her lips. For some reason, he suddenly found it terribly difficult to resist the urge in him. He couldn't help but step forward and give her a kiss at the corner of her lips. As soon as he did that, both of them were stunned. Even Cherry and Pete were dumbfounded. Then, Cherry turned away and covered her eyes. Yikes, how shameful. But I can't see anything anymore. Mommy and Daddy can continue what they are doing. As for Pete, he lowered his head and said calmly, Did something happen? Cherry, I was working on my problems just now, so I didn't see anything. Cherry shook her head wildly at once. Not at all, not at all. I was playing games the whole time, so I didn't see anything either. Nora, she kept quiet for a while, but in the end, she couldn't help but expose Cherry. You haven't even logged into your game. Cherry paused. Then, she picked up her phone and said, really? She sighed silently. These detestable underage restrictions. The child lock is still stopping me from playing games. Alas. Justin also couldn't resist exposing Pete. Your book is upside down. Pete. He straightened the book in silence. He was about to say something when Justin suddenly exchanged a look with Nora. Then, as if they were telepathic, the two of them picked up the two kids and gave Cherry and Pete each a kiss on the cheek. Cherry and Pete, who were caught off guard and kissed by their parents, reacted completely differently. Cherry blinked and said, Mommy, your mouth smells nice, I feel like my heart is soaring through the skies from the kiss, and I feel like I'm in such a good mood that I can play a hundred rounds without losing my temper. Nora replied, it seems that you're only allowed to play for an hour a day, though. Cherry. HMPH, mommy is so mean. Why does she always have to poke her where it hurts? As for Pete, he wiped his cheek in silence with a look of disgust. Justin. He looked at the sun in his arms, and then at his soft, tender, and sweet-talking daughter. Justin suddenly felt like he had kissed the wrong person. The brat simply mustn't be pampered.
While the four of them were being rowdy, upstairs, Xander's eyes were widened as he watched them in disbelief. It seemed like he had never seen people kissing one another like that. He touched his mouth and suddenly curled his lips disdainfully. Mouths were meant for eating. Wasn't it dirty to kiss people like that? Ha, huh, those two stupid kids. But he nevertheless touched his lips with his fingers. Then, he put two fingers together and rubbed them against his cheek. Was this what a kiss felt like? Xander was in a daze. But right after, he suddenly shuddered. Yuck, how gross. He would never do such childish things. He would never play with them either. With that in mind, Xander shrank back and crawled back into the bedroom. The family of four downstairs didn't see Xander come down even when lunchtime came. When Nora went upstairs to take a look, she found that Xander was pretending to be asleep. However, since he wasn't sick, she didn't expose him. After all, even though Xander might be her son, the final results weren't out yet. She didn't want to invest her emotions in him too early. In the event that it turned out that they weren't parent and child in the DNA test, yet she had already developed feelings for the child, things would become troublesome. And she had always been someone who hated trouble the most. Therefore, Nora went down the stairs and played with Cherry and Pete for a while. After that, the four of them went upstairs to pick the master bedroom. Princess Cherry straight up took two rooms. She wanted to merge the two rooms and then put her dolls in them. Pete's room was beside Cherry's. Even though Justin hadn't brought it up, he had also wanted to merge two rooms for Pete. However, Nora said, I think you can merge these two rooms and use one of them as a study. Pete's robots and books can be placed in there. She felt that their father was being too partial to one party, so she had to even things out. Pete's eyes, which were looking at Nora, lit up brightly at once. At the sight, even Nora couldn't help but ruffle his hair with a smile. Justin originally wanted to say that they didn't have to go about it in such a troublesome way. Once the brat grew up, he would just give him a small house and let him stay there instead of living with them. However, this was the only suggestion Nora had given about the renovation, so after a 0.1 second long silence, Justin still agreed to it in the end. When they left at night, Nora left Cherry there. After all, she couldn't let Justin be all alone either, could she? She had completely forgotten that when she first learned about the two children, she had wanted to kick a certain someone away and escape with the two kids. Bye-bye, mommy, I will miss you. Cherry stretched out her chubby little hand. After she said that cutely, she immediately took Justin's hand and raised her head. Her black jewel-like eyes were damp and moist, making it unbearable to see her like that. She said, Daddy, I'm so sad that I can't play my games. Can you really bear to make a cute little girl like me sad? Justin, Daddy, can you ask why to write me a program that can fool the system and make me look like an adult? In response to his pitiful daughter's demands, Justin only made one request, don't tell your mom about it. Don't worry, Daddy. Cherry's eyes were bright and shiny. I love Daddy the most. Justin. After that, Cherry went upstairs happily. While the family of four was happily spending time with one another, Mrs. Hunt was deeply troubled. After Nora had said that, she had returned to her house and called Thomas right away. When she called, Thomas and Helen had just exited the court. As he looked at the divorce decree in his hand, Thomas said, Helen, you should also understand that for wealthy families like ours, heirs take top priority. Nobody would want a woman like you who can't reproduce. On account of how we were married for three years, why don't you stay with me? I'm going to marry Cecilia, though after all, I have to give my child a proper identity. But don't worry, I won't treat you badly. What do you say? Helen clenched her fists as she listened to the disgusting things he was saying. She took a deep breath. A moment later, she slowly said, Thomas, what is so good about being with you? Are you that good in bed? Do you know how happy I am to be able to divorce you? At last, I don't have to tolerate your incompetence and inexplicable self-confidence anymore. Her words stabbed right into Thomas's sore spot. He had always been smug about his great stamina in bed. Thus, he immediately got angry and said furiously, Good going, Helen. You shameless ingrate. Okay, then we'll see just how miserable you'll be in the future. 
Hey, don't expect that I'll hide the truth for you when others ask me why we divorced. He turned around to leave after shouting at her. However, it was at this time that he received a call from Mrs. Hunt. Chapter 638 Taking Action Chapter 638 Taking Action When Thomas answered the phone, he heard Mrs. Hunt asking, Have you divorced her? Yes, I've collected the certificate. Thomas said. When he turned around to look at Helen, he instead saw that she had already gotten in the car and left. The sight infuriated him at once. In his opinion, Helen had to be in tears and crying her eyes out when she left him. But judging from her appearance, why did it look like she was dying to divorce him instead? While he was thinking about it, he heard what Mrs. Hunt said. Thomas immediately sneered, Grand Aunt, in my opinion, she must just be talking big again. Don't worry, I know my body well. There's definitely no problem with me. Also, I have already asked Cecilia about it. She is very sure that the child is mine. Because she is no longer in contact with her previous boyfriend. Cecilia was a well-known socialite in the circle and had a chaotic private life. Mrs. Hunt frowned and said, even so, you should still be cautious. Why don't you visit a hospital and go for a checkup? Even if you don't trust alternative medicine, surely you trust modern medicine, right? When Thomas heard this, he fell silent. It was only after a while that he finally replied, okay, okay, I get it. After hanging up the phone, he walked to his car. He opened the door. In the passenger seat was a woman with heavy makeup it was Cecilia. Cecilia asked, shall we go and register our marriage? Initially, Thomas had said that he would register his marriage with Cecilia immediately after he divorced Helen. After all, they couldn't get married after Cecilia's belly showed instead. If that happened, it would end up reflecting poorly on them. But when he thought of what Mrs. Hunt said just now, Thomas suddenly felt that there was no need to rush. He kissed Cecilia and said, Tisk, what's the hurry? The test can be done once the baby is four months old, right? We'll register the marriage after we do a DNA test. If you are in a hurry, we can hold the wedding first. DNA test. Cecilia's eyes flickered. She said, I see, Thomas, do you not trust me? If you don't trust me, then why are you marrying me? Exclamation mark. In that case, I will have the baby aborted right away. I don't want this baby anymore. It hasn't even been born yet, yet its father is already rejecting it. Why is my baby's life so hard? Thomas looked at her. That's enough, what are you putting up that act in front of me for? It's all because you have a bad reputation, so the elders at home are worried. Once the baby is four months old, we can do a DNA test and put my family's hearts at ease. Why wouldn't I trust you? But is there any use if I alone trust you? My family has to trust you too. Be good I know you are suffering injustice here, but if you have done nothing wrong, then what's there to be afraid of? It's just a DNA test. What's so scary about it? Cecilia bit her lip. She knew that Thomas had already made up his mind. Cecilia could only lower her head. I am doing this all for your sake. You mustn't bully me in the future. Okay, okay. Come on, let's go, baby. I'll buy you a ring. As the two drove off in the car, a touch of anxiety flashed across Cecilia's eyes. A day later, news that the Livingstones had divorced Helen because she was infertile spread throughout New York. What's going on? Why are you implicated by this? Cheryl, whose hair reached her shoulders, said angrily in front of Nora, not only are they saying that your medical skills are lacking and that you were bribed by. Helen, but they are also saying that you were planning to let the Livingstones be the scapegoat. Nora let out a huge yawn. She took a sip of water and asked, you woke me up so early just to say that. A confused Cheryl said, but it's not early anymore. It's already 11. Nora always slept until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. She sighed and took out a slice of bread. As she tore it into strips and ate it, Cheryl went on. Everyone's saying that you are too young and that you only have superficial mastery of Dr. Zabe's medical skills and not the essence, so your medical skills are lacking. They are too much. Nora uttered an, oh. Cheryl would like to say that she, an onlooker, was simply so much more anxious than the person involved herself. She asked, what are you going to do? 
Nora's eyes were a little dark as she replied, don't worry about it. She'd thought that the Stuarts would take it slow, but unexpectedly, they had actually taken action so quickly and so aggressively. Chapter 639 Face Slapping at the Birthday Party The rumors spread so wildly that the news became the juiciest piece of gossip in the circle. After all, rich elderly ladies loved gossiping about other people the most. The Stuarts had long since become the envy of everyone in New York because all the Stuart sisters had given birth to triplets, yet Helen couldn't. Everyone was laughing at them. As for Nora, when everyone heard that she wasn't actually that skilled in alternative medicine, they finally heaved a huge sigh of relief. It couldn't be helped. Ever since the return of the real young lady of the Smiths, she had already given everyone too many surprises. After hearing that her medical skills were lacking, everyone finally found her more down to earth. No one ridiculed her, however. In fact, don't get yourself down, Miss Smith. You are still young. It's only natural that the older and more experienced the doctor is in alternative medicine, the better they are. Yes, that's right. Miss Smith, alternative medicine pays more attention to relying on talking to the patient, observing the patient's symptoms, and skillful pulse diagnoses. You have been working behind closed doors and away from the masses previously, so it's only natural that you would have less experience. Besides, it's probably very difficult to tell through one's pulse that they have a condition like astenospermia, right? Therefore, this is not your fault. Ms. Smith, even though you didn't inherit the essence of Dr. Zabe's skills in alternative medicine, it doesn't matter. After all, you are great at modern medicine. For people like us, our hands would be shaking if we had to hold a scalpel, yet you can even operate on people's brains. That's really amazing. Ms. Smith, when are you and Mr. Hunt getting married? Has the wedding date been set? A group of women surrounded Nora and chattered away nonstop. Nora felt a headache coming on, and she somewhat regretted attending the party. It was Helen's birthday today. Yes, the day after her divorce was her birthday, but Thomas must have forgotten all about it, right? In order to wash away the dispirited air around her younger sister, Jessica, the eldest young lady of the Stuarts, had organized a grand birthday party for her. Jessica, who had married into the Scots, had six children four boys and two girls. Her status in the family was also very high. Since she had personally organized the birthday party, on account of the Scots, most of the invited guests would attend. Moreover, Jessica was also intending to seek a new partner for Helen at the birthday party. The best way to shake off a previous relationship was to start another one right away. Nora had also been invited, so she was also here. She nodded at the people around her indifferently and walked to the side. After she left, the few people said mockingly to the people sucking up to her just now, she's not even Mrs. Hunt yet, I don't know why you people are flattering her so much. Besides, her medical skills aren't that great either. The few of them, however, sneered, even if she isn't Mrs. Hunt, she's still Miss Smith. Besides, you make it sound as if you people are that great. I really don't know what gives you the idea that you can look down on others. The people mocking them suddenly choked on their breaths. Elsewhere, Nora had walked up to Helen, who looked listless and as though she couldn't get her spirits up at all. Jessica was lecturing her. Can't you psych yourself up a little? Is that scumbag really worth you doing this? Helen hung her head and sighed. Jessica, I'm not doing this for him. But I really find it pointless to announce the truth at the party. So what even if everyone knows that I'm not infertile? Do we want the people approaching the Stuarts to propose marriage only for Stuarts' ability to reproduce? Sometimes, people who had been hurt too deeply found it a chore to even fight back. Jessica looked as if she had expected better from her, yet she also choked at her words. At this moment, a flurry of activity suddenly came from the door. The three of them looked over to see a woman with heavy makeup walking in it was Cecilia. Helen's pupils shrank at once and she stood up. Cecilia smiled and said, Helen, it's your birthday today, so I've come to give you a gift. I'd also like to offer you my apologies. Thomas really shouldn't have spread the truth everywhere like that. His actions are too hurtful towards you. Helen, who had looked utterly listless just a second ago, immediately got all fired up. Nora, 
As expected, the one capable of stimulating Helen would only be the enemy she hated the most, right? Chapter 640 Her Schemes Fail Chapter 640 Her Schemes Fail Nora raised her eyebrows. Helen clenched her fists and asked hostilely, What are you doing here? Cecilia walked over and sighed. I am here to give you a gift, of course. She handed over the gift box in her hand. Thomas bought this handbag for me. I think it suits you well, so I'll just give it to you. The handbag that Thomas had bought for her, Thomas had never bought her even a single gift during their three years of marriage. Helen became even angrier, and she felt like her heart hurt a little. In the end, what exactly was her three-year-long marriage? She clutched her chest and took a step back. Jessica stepped in front of her and said, Sorry, you are not welcome here. Cecilia sighed. Jessica, you can say that we were close friends back then. There are only so many people in the circle. They may be divorced, but do the Stuarts really want to have a sour relationship with the Livingstones? I'm sure the people attending the birthday party today wouldn't want to see the two families fall out with each other, either. The people around them felt rather awkward at once. For the sake of the Scots, they were willing to attend the party, but if they were going to fall out with the Livingstones, then they would be unwilling to see that happen. Cecilia's words seemed to force the people present into taking sides, in other words, forcing them to become enemies with the Livingstones. To be honest, the Livingstones weren't scary. It was the Hunts who were. Everyone glanced at Nora and then at Cecilia. Nora was the Hunts, future mistress, but Cecilia was part of the Livingstones, and the Livingstones were the elderly Mrs. Hunt's family. Would Mrs. Hunt sit by idly and watch the Livingstones get bullied? For a while there, everyone was thrown into an internal struggle. Had they known this would happen, they would have made up an excuse and skipped the party. Jessica understood what they were thinking. They were only here as a favor to her so that the divorce wouldn't look so awful on their part. They had kind intentions, so she couldn't possibly let the people who had come leave the place unhappily. Therefore, Jessica said promptly and decisively, you're making it sound more serious than it is. What do you mean by a sour relationship or whatnot? Are the Stuarts and the Livingstones going to become enemies just because the two of them have divorced? We are still friends. Besides, I even sent an invitation to the Livingstones for Helen's birthday party today. Cecilia went with the flow and said, that's right. Since we are friends, then don't you welcome your friend here. Jessica, the huffy woman could only say in an aggrieved manner, I was just worried about your health. After all, you're pregnant, aren't you? She looked at Cecilia's belly. Cecilia's belly was already starting to show a little. Jessica immediately said, I heard you are one month pregnant. Why does your belly look like you are three months pregnant instead, though? As soon as she said that, Cecilia's eyes flickered. She was so scared that she looked straight at Jessica. However, the other party had a sincere look on her face as though she didn't mean anything else by what she said. Cecilia breathed a sigh of relief. She must have been thinking too much. At this time, there was activity at the door again. Everyone turned their heads to see Thomas walking in. He even had a bouquet of flowers in his hand when he entered. At the sight of him, everyone looked at one another. To be honest, in a divorce between two wealthy families, it was impossible for the two families to break off all ties with each other because the two families' businesses had already become entangled with each other's at the point of marriage. This was the reason why so many people would rather have their own relationships in private than divorce. Driven by interests, to be honest, even Jessica didn't actually want to fall out with the Livingstones, either. The reason for the birthday party today, as well as why she had even invited Thomas to the party, was actually so that she could give Thomas the evidence of Cecilia's cheating behind closed doors. By choosing to tell them the truth before Cecilia and Thomas got married, one could say that she was showing the Livingstones goodwill. After that, they would publicly announce that Thomas and Helen's divorce was not because of Helen's infertility. Jessica knew that this way of doing things was actually very frustrating. But she had no other choice. This was the way it was in the world of grown-ups. Jessica's plans were very beautifully thought out. Seeing that Thomas was also being very supportive and had even brought flowers, she breathed a sigh of relief at once. She walked over and said, you're here. 
Thomas had always had a good reputation among outsider. This was also why Mrs. Livingstone was sure that the Livingstones, reputation wouldn't suffer even if they divorced. He looked straight at Helen and handed her the bouquet. He said, a night of love is worth a hundred days of friendship after all. Even though we are no longer husband and wife, we are still friends. If you ever need my help, you can approach me. During the divorce the day before, the bastard had said such scummy things in private, causing Helen to leave in fury. But when he said those words today, even though she knew very well that the man's words were not to be trusted and were false, in that instant, Helen still felt like crying. As she held her tears back, she lowered her head, took the flowers from him, and nodded. Then, she said, excuse me, I have to go for a change of clothes. After speaking, she turned and walked upstairs. Jessica wanted to follow her, but more guests arrived at the door at this point. As the hostess, Jessica had to greet them. A bored Nora was about to follow Helen when Thomas stopped her. He said, Ms. Smith. The man's smile made him look very cheap. Nora raised her brows. Elsewhere, Helen had reached the stairwell on the third floor. She was about to turn the corner when she heard a voice come from behind her, Helen. Surprised, she looked back to see that Cecilia had followed after her at some point and was standing on the step below her. After Cecilia came up, she held her hand and said, I have something to tell you. Chapter 641 The Unsuccessful Scheme Backfires Chapter 641 The Unsuccessful Scheme Backfires Helen stared at her and snapped angrily, are you here to tell me that the child is not Thomas's? Cecilia's expression changed drastically at once. She said, what nonsense are you talking about? Helen sneered, the bellies of women only one month pregnant won't show at all. They only show up when they are at least three months pregnant. But Thomas was not in the country at all three months ago. Hey, did Thomas take you abroad with him? Cecilia clenched her fists and narrowed her eyes. What nonsense are you talking about? My baby is only one month old. My belly is only showing because I have been eating too much recently, so I have gained weight. I know you can't have children, so you're venting your anger on me, but even so, surely you can't slander me like that, right? Helen took a deep breath. Then we'll just wait for the Livingstones to do the DNA test when you're four months pregnant. She turned to leave. However, Cecilia grabbed her arm and held it tightly. She sneered, you are just jealous of me, right? That's why you're saying things like waiting for me to become four months pregnant and whatnot. Mark my words, I won't give you the opportunity to do that. After speaking, she suddenly let go and fell backward. No one noticed what was happening to them. At that moment, Nora, who had been stopped by Thomas, yawned sleepily and asked, you need something. Thomas smiled. You sure are stubborn, Miss Smith. Given how things are, you still told my granddad that I'm sick. Nora looked at him and replied seriously, you really are sick. You're the one that's goddamn sick. Thomas suddenly lowered his voice and swore. He said, Nora, don't think that you're my sister-in-law just because they say so. You'd best keep this in mind. Even if you've married Justin, I'm not to be trifled with, much less when you haven't even married him yet. Also, I'd advise you to show my grandaunt respect. Otherwise, don't blame me if I don't hold back. I have a hundred ways to make your life a living hell. Nora, she asked curiously, which hundred ways are those? She only had the same few methods she used for interrogation, so she was really rather curious. If they proved useful, she could even tell Morris about them and impart them to the special department. Thomas sneered, didn't you just have a taste of the suffering that public opinion can bring? Everyone now knows that your alternative medicine skills are half-baked. Half of the power and authority that you established in the field of medicine has been destroyed by me. Ha. Huh. 4. Nora sighed disappointedly. She wanted to tell him that it didn't affect her in the least and that she didn't feel anything at all. But before she could speak, a scream suddenly rang out from the side. Then, together with the scream, a thud rang out, like that of someone rolling down the stairs and then hitting the floor heavily. Nora's pupils shrank. She turned around abruptly and walked towards the stairs. Thomas was also taken aback. Why does that voice sound so much like Cecilia's? Cecilia, it seemed like she had left with Helen just now. 
one must know that Cecilia was currently pregnant with his child. When Thomas thought of this, he hurriedly walked over. When he saw a group of people surrounding the front, he immediately took a step forward and broke into a furious rant without even a moment's thought. Helen, what did you do to Cecilia? You vicious jealous woman. But as soon as he walked over and saw the person lying on the ground, he was utterly stunned. A minute ago, Cecilia grabbed Helen's arm. With a mocking smile on her lips, she said, I will never give you the opportunity to do that. She mustn't keep the child. If she did, it would just be evidence of her cheating. However, she mustn't let the baby just disappear either. If she had a miscarriage right after she was asked to do a DNA test, it would arouse too much suspicion. Besides, if she lost the baby, it would become even more unlikely for Thomas to marry her. This was the only solution she had. If she lost the baby because Helen had pushed her off the stairs, it would give the Livingstones an excuse to attack Helen. And when Cecilia became the victim, the Livingstones would have to take responsibility for her. Even if it was just for the sake of dealing with public opinion, in order not to bring shame to the family, they would still let her marry into the family to appease her. The corners of her lips curled up into a smile as she cooked up a beautiful daydream. In fact, she was already imagining the day when she would become Mrs. Livingstone. Therefore, she let go of Helen and let herself fall down the stairs. But the next moment, someone grabbed her arm tightly. Helen grabbed her forcefully, pulled her up, and then pushed her further up the stairs. Helen fell down the stairs while Cecilia was pushed up the stairs onto the third floor. When Cecilia looked back again, she saw the look in the eyes of Helen, who had always been elegant and gentle, in midair as she fell. Her lips moved and she said, I will definitely give you that opportunity. Chapter 642 The Badass Nora Smith Chapter 642 The Badass Nora Smith Cecilia, she was so shocked that she couldn't even move. It was only when the others rushed over that she finally came back to her senses. With this, she couldn't give herself a miscarriage anymore. It would be too obvious if she fell again. Also, it wouldn't be Helen who pushed her down anymore. For a while, Cecilia could neither advance nor retreat. At the top of the stairs, Nora was giving first aid to Helen. She had slowly started to bleed after she fell down the stairs, and she was extremely weak at the moment. Nora gave her a checkup and found that she had suffered bone fractures and a slight concussion, but was not in danger of dying. Only then did she breathe a sigh of relief. She was about to speak when Jessica rushed over and shouted, Helen, what happened? Helen was in a lot of pain. Both her arms and her legs hurt, but she still stared hard at Cecilia and said, Cecilia was planning to falsely accuse me of pushing her down the stairs. I accidentally fell trying to save her. Everyone there was a member of the rich and powerful circle. All of them were very familiar with little tricks like that. Jessica understood everything with just those few words of hers. Her eyes turned red from anger. She pointed at Helen and shouted, How can you be so muddle-headed? Even if she succeeds in slandering you, we still have evidence against her. Jessica had already found Cecilia's adulterous lover in other words, the father of the baby a long time ago. She was planning to hand him over to Thomas together with the evidence today. But Helen instead smiled at her wryly and said, Jessica, you don't understand what the Livingstones are like. Without the baby, there won't be any direct evidence. For the sake of not shaming themselves, they would rather refuse to admit or believe it. If the child was gone, Cecilia and her lover would be able to insist that nothing had happened. After all, even if Cecilia did have sexual relations with her lover three months ago, her private life had always been chaotic anyway. The Livingstones would never believe a word of what they said. Therefore, nothing must happen to the child because it was the most crucial evidence. Helen was in so much pain that her face was as white as a sheet. While the ambulance hadn't yet arrived, she lay where she was and said to Jessica, I thought it through in that moment just now. Women have to stand up for themselves, otherwise, they will forever be looked down upon. Jessica, I have become strong. See, I'm actually in so much pain right now, but I didn't even cry. Seeing her younger sister like that, Jessica's eyes reddened. She nodded. Go to the hospital first. I'll handle the rest. 
I'm not going, Jessica, I want to stay here and watch them make a joke out of themselves. Helen grabbed Nora's hand and refused to let go, for fear that if she did, she would be taken away by the ambulance. Jessica kept quiet for a while. Nora said, she's fine for the time being. Only then did Jessica agree. Everyone around them had heard their conversation. Even Thomas frowned and looked at Cecilia. When he looked at Cecilia, who was upstairs, the woman finally regained her senses. She hurriedly came down and shouted, Helen, I know you loathe and hate me. I have also been apologizing to you the entire time just now. I told you, even if I become Mrs. Livingstone, you still have a place in Thomas's heart. The separation is not your fault, it was just because you can't have children. But how can you jump down the stairs yourself and falsely accuse me like that? You even said that I won't have the chance to become Mrs. Livingstone when you jump down, sob. It's fine even if you don't want me to become Mrs. Livingstone, but you can't use such a suicidal method to make false accusations towards me. Thomas, you have to stand up for me. Thomas immediately glared at Helen furiously. Why are you starting to resort to such tricks like crying, kicking up a huge fuss, and threatening suicide? Are you trying to save our marriage with those tricks? I'll tell you this no way. When Helen saw how Thomas had chosen to believe Cecilia without any hesitation, she knew at once that she had done the right thing just now. If the child was gone, Thomas would definitely refuse to believe the truth. She clenched her fists. Suddenly, she looked at Cecilia and said, In that case, do you dare to go to the hospital for a test? Cecilia nodded. Of course. Why wouldn't I? But for the baby, I want to wait until it's four months old before I do it. It's only a little over one month old right now, so there is no way to do the test. For the sake of my baby's health, we have to wait. Thomas and I have already talked about it. Besides, I have a clear conscience, so I'm not afraid. I am not scared of any test. It's just that it's not the right time yet. Don't worry, two months later, I will have it done even without you needing to mention it. She was stalling for time. A lot of things could happen in two and a half months. At the worst, she would just find an opportunity to have a miscarriage at the very last moment. In any case, she mustn't cement those claims at the moment. Just as Cecilia thought so triumphantly to herself, Nora suddenly stood up impatiently. She gave a wave, upon which the two bodyguards that Justin had given her rushed over. Nora pointed to Cecilia and ordered, take her to the hospital for the test. I will take responsibility for all the consequences. Chapter 643 Results The two bodyguards walked up to Cecilia obediently. Terrified, Cecilia screamed and grabbed Thomas's hand. She said, Thomas, the baby is still too young. It will die if the test is done on it. I've already asked about it, it can only be done when the baby four months old. Thomas was also outraged. He looked straight at Nora. What are you doing? Do you have no regard for human lives whatsoever? Nora cast her eyes down. Four months old. If you count the time, it's already about there anyway. When Cecilia told Thomas about her pregnancy, she had already been more than three months pregnant. Now that a few more days had gone by, the time was almost right. Besides, she would be asking Lily to do the amniocentesis test, in addition to the DNA test. She had relatively good technique, so it would not harm the baby. Although the child was not Thomas's, when it came to children, Nora had never thought of going as far as to take its life. Even if Cecilia, the child's mother, didn't want the child anymore. Cecilia's pupils shrank, but she still firmly refused to admit it. What do you mean by that? You must be Helen's friend, right? Are you actually doing something like this just for Helen? Do you have any idea who the Livingstones are or not? Don't you know that the Livingstones and the Hunts share very close ties? As soon as she said that, Thomas said, this is Nora. Nora Smith. Cecilia's eyes flickered a couple of times and she understood at once. Her expression changed drastically in fright. But she absolutely must not go with them. Once she did, everything would be over. Therefore, despite spacing out for a moment, Cecilia quickly calmed down and continued acting. She said, I get it now. It's because you misdiagnosed Thomas, so you want to vent your anger on us now, right? Thomas. 
Do you really not want the baby anymore? Don't forget that the doctor has already said that it's certain that our baby is a boy. There were many ways of determining whether a child was male or female when they became six weeks old. One of them was by looking at the ultrasound scan when the baby was six weeks old. If the fetus was rectangular, it was a boy. If it was squarish, then it was a girl. There was also numerical data to support the theory. Therefore, Cecilia was very sure that the baby in her belly was a boy. Her shout made Thomas even more anxious. When he was 20 years old, he had accidentally impregnated a woman. Later, as the woman's social status was too low, Mrs. Livingstone had forced her to have an abortion. After that, for some strange reason, even though Thomas had fooled around with a lot of women, he had never managed to get anyone pregnant ever again. At first, he'd thought that it was because he was lucky and had done a good job at taking preventive measures. But even after marrying Helen, he still didn't have children despite so much time passing. To be honest, he was also very anxious about it. Now that Cecilia had become pregnant after so much difficulty and the baby was even a boy, Thomas went up to the two bodyguards and got physical at once. He said, don't touch her. I'm telling you, don't touch her. I will fight whoever touches my baby. Unfortunately, the two bodyguards didn't listen to him at all. One of them grabbed him while the other grabbed Cecilia's arm. The people Justin gave to Nora would naturally be rather skilled. There was no need for Nora to take any action at all. They subdued Cecilia straight away and led her or rather, forced her out. Nora didn't look back. Instead, she got the paramedics to take Helen with them straight away. The group walked out the door with great momentum and went to the hospital. Behind them, Thomas was shouting, Nora Smith. Helen Stewart. This is no different than kidnapping. I will never let you people off. He struggled and tried to break free of the bodyguard's hold. It was just a shame that he simply couldn't break free, no matter what he did. He looked at the bodyguard and yelled furiously, Justin Hunt is my cousin. You've got a lot of balls to have the audacity to do this to me. However, the bodyguard still kept his eyes lowered and said nothing. It was only when Nora and the others got into the ambulance and headed towards the hospital that he finally let go of him. After Thomas regained his freedom, he took out his cell phone and called Mrs. Livingstone. Then, he rushed out. By the time he drove over to the hospital, Mrs. Livingstone had also arrived. The two went upstairs together and found the place where they had forcibly brought Cecilia to. Cecilia had already been forcibly pushed into the operating room for an amniocentesis test. As for Nora, she had dressed Helen's fracture and arranged for her to be sent to the VIP ward. Thomas rushed in at this point and yelled at the two of them, Helen, that's enough. Just because you can't have any children, do you also want to kill off my family line? If anything happens to my son, I will kill you. Helen was already as calm as still waters by now. All her sadness at the divorce had already disappeared. Perhaps it was when Thomas cheated on her, or perhaps it was when she slowly discovered Thomas's true colors, but after a point, she didn't have any feelings for Thomas anymore. She kept her gaze lowered and said nothing. Jessica said, it doesn't take long for amniocentesis test results to be out. The same goes for DNA tests. You will receive the results very soon. Thomas, however, sneered and said, you people were the ones who took Cecilia. Who can be sure whose DNA sample it is? Jessica said, you can take Cecilia's DNA sample and do a test yourself. Thomas frowned deeply and said, Jessica Stewart, Nora Smith, do the two of you have any idea what you are doing? Just who is it that gave you the guts to do that to my woman? Almost as soon as he said that, a deep voice came from the door, me. Thomas froze when he heard the voice. When he looked behind him, he immediately saw the big and tall Justin standing right there. Thomas's flames of fury were extinguished at once. Nora raised her eyebrows slightly and walked over. She asked, why are you here? Justin cast his eyes down, his voice gradually warming up as he replied, to inspect the hospital, and also to visit Quentin along the way. When I heard that you are also here, I came over to have a look. Quentin was Nora's cousin, so of course he would have to take good care of him. Enlightened, Nora nodded. At this point, Thomas rushed over. 
Justin, Justin, you have to help me. Isn't Nora clearly bullying me here? If she doesn't like Cecilia and likes Helen more, she could have just said so earlier. That way, I wouldn't have gotten a divorce. But she's straight up getting rid of my baby, Justin. I can't have that. Justin laughed. Your baby, can you even have children? Thomas choked. Then, he insisted stubbornly and said, why wouldn't I be able to have children, Justin? The baby in Cecilia's belly is mine. Justin said coolly, oh, then let's just wait a few hours for now. Thomas. Since even Justin had told him to wait, of course Thomas wouldn't dare to go against him. However, Mrs. Livingstone, who was standing next to him, suddenly said, Justin, since you're standing up for them, then I can take a step back with regard to Ms. Smith and that little bitch Helen bullying the Livingstones. We will not pursue the matter of them making the decision on their own to do an amniocentesis test for us. But if Cecilia's baby is indeed Thomas's, or if the amniocentesis test leads to a miscarriage or other consequences, then we must be compensated for the damages. Before Justin could say anything, Jessica had already asked, what kind of compensation do the Livingstones want? Mrs. Livingstone suddenly smiled. I have heard a long time ago that your family has a secret technique for having triplets, right? If the child is Cecilia's, then you must give us the medicine for having triplets for free. As compensation. Medicine for having triplets. Upon hearing this, Nora suddenly looked at Jessica. For some reason, she suddenly had a strange feeling in her heart. At this moment, Lily finally walked out of the operating room. Chapter 644 Heartless Boss Chapter 644 Heartless Boss When Lily came out, everyone looked at her. Mrs. Livingstone was the first to ask, is the child okay? Thomas looked at her angrily as if she had just killed his child. However, Lily ignored these two people and walked straight to Nora. One had to know that Lily was considered a famous surgeon outside. When had she been treated so slowly by others? Oh, except for her boss. Just like now, she had already walked to Nora, but Nora still did not speak. She could only say, Boss, I've successfully taken the DNA sample, the patient's child is fine. Nora's reply was, Okay. She yawned widely. Lily, Thomas, who was beside him, glared at her. You said that there's no problem, but how can I trust you? I've already asked how to do amniotic fluid puncture. Forget about one month, even at four months the probability of a miscarriage is very high. Nora looked at him slowly. It's highly unlikely that anything would go wrong when Lily is the one performing such a small procedure. Thomas. Lily, who was inexplicably praised, instantly raised her chin in excitement. Her proud expression was very obvious. She rolled her eyes and handed a DNA sample to Thomas. This is your child's DNA. You can find a random testing facility now. If you suspect that I change the sample, you can go to Cecilia's side now to take her DNA sample for comparison. My results will be out in two hours. Sigh. The DNA testing lab would have taken at least three hours to produce the results. How could she only need two hours? She was too good. Lily helplessly took another DNA sample and went straight to the monitoring room in the hospital. As she walked, she could not help but think, was it okay to refer to herself now as a professional DNA tester? After Lily left, there was silence. Thomas looked at Nora and wanted to say something, but because Justin was present, he could only remain silent. After staying there for a while, he saw Cecilia being pushed out. Thomas pursed his lips and strode toward her. Amidst her cries of surprise, he plucked a few strands of her hair and turned to leave. Cecilia had her hair pulled out, but she could not say a word at this moment. She knew that she was finished. When Mrs. Livingstone saw Cecilia, she had already rushed up and held her hand to ask, Cecilia, how are you now? Where's the child? Is the child still around? She felt that the child would definitely not make it. One month pregnant was the easiest time to have a miscarriage. After the amniotic fluid was punctured, the child would definitely be gone. Unexpectedly, when he said this, Cecilia actually revealed a hesitant expression. She bit her lip and said after a moment, it, it's still. Still here. Mrs. Livingstone was also surprised, but she continued, it's okay. 
Some people don't have a miscarriage immediately, in Mrs. Livingstone's opinion, the child in Cecilia's stomach was Thomas's. Even if it was gone, it didn't matter. At the very least, after getting the secret to having triplets, their family could also have triplets. Who would care about Cecilia? Therefore, what she cared about the most now was to get the DNA results and then slap the faces of the Stuarts and Nora. Nora did not have the time to stay in the hospital and wait for the results. Justin was also a busy person. If he wanted to manage such a big company, he definitely could not waste time. But with these two people together, Justin whispered, wait for the results. Nora glanced at him and suddenly felt that being with him, wasting two to three hours was nothing. She nodded, so the two of them sat down on the bench in the hospital corridor and began to chat. What was Cherry doing when you went out? Justin said, oh, don't worry. I didn't let her play games. If there was no flicker in his eyes when he said this, it would have been more believable. Nora pursed her lips and chided him. Her eyes are still developing. If she stares at her phone all the time, she will become short-sighted. It's okay. She's a girl. If she wants to play, she can play for a while. Besides, we're not short-sighted, so it's not genetic. I help her do eye exercises every day and give her fish liver oil. Nora, she grimaced. Don't you think you're spoiling her too much? Is that so? Justin thought about it seriously. It's okay. Cherry isn't arrogant and willful. She has a sweet mouth and is especially obedient. I didn't spoil her much either. The child is sensible. Nora felt that she simply could not argue with Justin. She sighed silently. At this moment, Lily came out with the DNA test results. Lily walked to Nora and yawned too. Then, she handed the results to her. Lawrence, who had followed Justin, teased, Lily, you've been with Miss Smith for a long time. Are you also so sleepy? This is the third yawn I've seen from you today. Lily said unhappily, boss yawns because of sleepiness. I'm yawning because I'm too tired. I haven't slept for 24 hours. Lawrence, I'm sorry. When Mrs. Livingstone saw Lily, she walked over and asked, what was the outcome? The child must be Thomas's, right? Chapter 645 DNA Testing for the Truth Chapter 645 DNA Testing for the Truth Nora glanced at the report and could not be bothered with this woman. She threw the report to her. Mrs. Livingstone immediately took it. After taking a look, she was stunned and frowned tightly. Jessica, who was accompanying Helen, walked over at the right time. When she saw Mrs. Livingstone's disbelieving expression, she walked to her and said, this child is almost four months old. Now that the results are out, Mrs. Livingstone, you should believe it, right? Hearing her words, Mrs. Livingstone suddenly looked up. She did not dare to believe this report and said, impossible. After I found out that Cecilia was pregnant, I personally took her to the hospital for another checkup. It was indeed a month old. How could she not know how long Cecilia was pregnant for? She had suspected it before, so she specially took Cecilia to the hospital. Yesterday, before Thomas got a divorce, she had done a fresh checkup. As soon as she said this, Jessica asked, which hospital did you go to? Mrs. Livingstone said, New York Women's and Children's Hospital. Jessica lowered her eyes and sneered. Don't you know that the director of that hospital is Cecilia's cousin? Mrs. Livingstone. She was stunned. How could this be? Why would she bother to find out who the director of New York Women's and Children's Hospital was? Therefore, she had never thought of this question. However, when she went to the hospital and confirmed that the child was only one month old, the doctor had joked, eat less. Those who don't know might think that your tummy is more than three months old. If you're too fat, it'll lead to premature labor. That was why she was certain that the child in Cecilia's stomach was Thomas's. But now, she realized that perhaps this was all planned by Cecilia long ago. Mrs. Livingstone's expression changed from white to purple and then to as pale as paper. A series of changes made Nora, who was beside her, click her tongue in admiration. However, Mrs. Livingstone refused to admit this. This DNA report is definitely fake. You must be lying to me. She took a step back and stared at Jessica and Nora. Have you two worked together? Hee <laughs> hee, are you still going to say that there's nothing wrong with Nora's medical skills? 
Let me tell you, it's impossible. My son can't have weak semen. If the child in Cecilia's stomach was really not Thomas's, this proved Nora's previous guess about Thomas being infertile. But how could her son be infertile? No way. This report was definitely fake. Jessica sighed. Miss Smith had already guessed that you might not believe it, so she got your son to find a random lab outside to do it. We can wait for your son's results. With that, she decided not to go back to the ward and sat on the bench in the corridor. She said, Mrs. Livingstone, as tennispermia can be treated. You don't have to look like you're mourning your parents. At least your family wasn't deceived by Cecilia, right? Mrs. Livingstone sneered. I don't believe anything you're saying now. I want to wait for my son to come back. All right, then. After waiting for more than two hours, Thomas finally returned. The moment he appeared in the corridor, Mrs. Livingstone stood up and hurried over. Son, is the result out? What is it? The child is yours, right? Tell me these people are lying to me. They brought me a fake DNA report. Thomas's expression was dark and he looked very angry. He did not speak for a moment. After a while, he pushed Mrs. Livingstone away and entered Cecilia's ward. When Mrs. Livingstone saw this scene, she was overjoyed. A relaxed expression finally appeared on her face as she sneered at Jessica. Did you see that? My son went to see Cecilia first after returning. This means that Cecilia's child is definitely his. Otherwise, why would he care so much about Cecilia? However, as soon as she finished speaking, she heard Thomas's angry roar coming from the ward. Tell me, who is the father of this bastard child? Chapter 646 Furious Chapter 646 Furious After the angry roar, Cecilia kept her mouth shut. This child is yours. What nonsense are you talking about? Smack. A slap landed ruthlessly. Thomas roared, this child isn't mine. The evidence is conclusive now, but you're still lying here. Tell me, whose child is this? It's yours. Cecilia refused to speak. Fuck, I'll beat you to death. Thomas could not stand it anymore. Even in front of so many people, he began to curse. The ward was instantly in chaos. Then, medical staff rushed in and said that Cecilia was pregnant, urging Thomas not to do anything. Outside the ward, Mrs. Livingstone stood there in a daze. What did Thomas say in the ward? Was that child a bastard? Bastard. Did this mean that the child was not Thomas's? Then what Jessica and Nora said was right. Mrs. Livingstone suddenly looked at Nora and Jessica, her son really had asked Hennespermia. He might not have a child of his own in this lifetime. Mrs. Livingstone stood on the spot in shock. The determination she had shown in front of them earlier was just as helpless and face-smacking now. She felt very embarrassed, especially since they were in the VIP ward. People in the VIP ward at this private hospital were all from wealthy families. Justin had come personally. At this moment, everyone around had already stretched their necks to look at them. A day ago, when the two of them got a divorce, Mrs. Livingstone had even spread rumors outside to prevent the Livingstones from being criticized. She said that it was fine if Helen could not have a child, but she even teamed up with Nora and planned to turn the tables on her. But now, someone shouted, Mrs. Livingstone, so Helen didn't play the blame game. The one who can't have a child is really your son. In front of Justin, someone also began to suck up to him. Miss Smith's medical skills are really awesome. It's alternative medicine. She can tell that he has weak semen just by taking his pulse. As expected of Dr. Zabe's disciple. Yes, yes. Mrs. Livingstone, you were still talking nonsense just now. How Miss Smith's medical skills aren't good and she's too young and hasn't grasped the essence of alternative medicine. Now, you realize that you've wronged her, right? 2. 11. Mrs. Livingstone bit her lip in anger. The Livingstones had always had a good reputation outside. Firstly, Mrs. Hunt knew how to conduct herself and had always taught them not to do embarrassing things, so the Livingstones had developed the habit of hiding embarrassing things. Secondly, Mrs. Livingstone was very scheming. When she heard these words, her eyes instantly turned red. She held Nora's hand. Miss Smith, you're really a godly doctor. We've wronged you. It's all my fault. Look, can you help Thomas treat his illness? Nora. She raised her eyebrows and suddenly smiled. Mrs. 
Livingstone, I'm sorry. I'll be staying at home to educate my children and take care of my husband in the future. I won't embarrass myself outside. Mrs. Livingstone. She was stunned for a moment before realizing these were the words that she herself had said in a moment of anger back at the hunts. Now, Nora was using these words to shut her mouth. Mrs. Livingstone bit her lip in anger, but in front of so many people, she continued to apologize. Miss Smith, I know you're angry. For the sake of Mrs. Hunt, don't fuss about it with me. I'm an elder, so I'll inevitably be a little biased when I do things. I apologize to you, okay. Nora, I only decided to concentrate on recuperating from now on because of you. I won't show my face outside anymore. Isn't this what you told me two days ago? Mrs. Livingstone, the surrounding people were speechless. Who had not been sick before? No one could guarantee that they would not have to beg Nora in the future. Therefore, everyone criticized Mrs. Livingstone. Mrs. Livingstone, you're being too much. What era is it now? How can a woman not have her own career? That's right. Do you think we're living in ancient times? Should a woman just raise her children and stay at home? Mrs. Livingstone, you're really old and outdated. Which young person these days isn't busy with their career? Besides, anyone can be a wife in a wealthy family. If Miss Smith doesn't use her medical skills, won't she be wasting her talent? Mrs. Livingstone had always been someone who could occupy the highest position in public with just a few words. However, she did not expect that this time, she would be defeated by Nora's two sentences. She was furious. Hearing the words around her, she suddenly lowered her voice and said in a voice only Nora and she could hear, Nora, don't be shameless. So what if your medical skills are good? Others can also treat his illness. My son will give birth to his own child sooner or later, but what about you? You still have to face Justin's illegitimate son. These words made Nora's pupils shrink. Then, she heard Mrs. Livingstone continue, I heard that the illegitimate son has a very strange temper. He's almost a little demon king. He grew up outside, has a very wild personality, and doesn't have any manners. He stirred up trouble at home and wouldn't let anyone have a moment of peace. I think you should indeed put down your career and stay at home. You should teach your eldest illegitimate son well. Hey. Chapter 647 Triplets. Chapter 647 Triplets. He was wild, rude, and had a strange temper, little demon. These words entered Nora's ears, making her very uncomfortable. She did not understand why, but when she heard others say that about Xander, she felt that although she was right, these bad words were too much for a child. Her eyes turned cold suddenly and she sneered. Do you think it's really that easy to treat his weak semen? Mrs. Livingstone was stunned and asked, what do you mean? Nora had already lowered her eyes and did not want to speak anymore. Thomas had been overly indulgent and had serious kidney deficiency. His weak semen had already reached the level of sterilization. This illness was really difficult to treat. However, if he wanted a child, she had an alternative medicine pill. She had originally wanted to say this, but after Mrs. Livingstone had scolded Xander, she suddenly decided not to mention it. Yes, she could not be bothered to mention it previously. She smirked and did not say anything else. Mrs. Livingstone still wanted to ask more, but Jessica walked forward and stopped her. She lowered her voice and said, Mrs. Livingstone, I have clues about the adulterer. I can provide them to you for free. Mrs. Livingstone narrowed her eyes and looked at her warily. Are you that kind? Jessica sighed. I just want you to take back what you said about my sister not being able to have children. If this gets out, my sister's future won't be easy. When Mrs. Livingstone heard this, she suddenly thought of something. She instantly smiled and grabbed Jessica's hand. Jessica, look. This is a misunderstanding. We can't get a divorce. Thomas is just a child. He also realizes his mistake this time. The two children are really ignorant. Why are they getting a divorce so hastily? Sigh, I think we'll get them to remarry tomorrow. Jessica, she frowned. Mrs. Livingstone, they're already divorced. Besides, my sister can't possibly live with your son anymore. Mrs. Livingstone waved her hand. Why not? They're husband and wife. A day as husband and wife means a hundred days of grace. 
When they got a divorce, I saw that Helen was also very sad. Now that I know that this is all a misunderstanding, I think we should let them get back together. Don't worry, I'll look after Thomas in the future. I won't let him make any mistakes again. Nora, who was beside him, could not help but interrupt. He doesn't have the ability to make mistakes anymore. He had been indulging himself too much. He probably can't even get a morning erection anymore. He still wanted to make a mistake. Tisk. When Mrs. Livingstone heard this, she blushed. Jessica was even more furious. She lowered her voice and said, Mrs. Livingstone, I asked you to say this because our family doesn't want to fall out with you. I think you shouldn't go overboard. With that, she leaned closer to Mrs. Livingstone and lowered her voice. Mr. Hunt is right here. I'm sure you saw his attitude. I don't think you want to make things difficult for Mr. Hunt and Mrs. Hunt, right? The sole reason the Livingstones were respected in New York was Mrs. Hunt. Mrs. Livingstone also relied on this confidence, but Justin was the head of the Hunts. When Mrs. Livingstone heard this, she knew that this matter could not be blown out of proportion. She lowered her voice and said, All right, in that case, let's make a deal. I'll help Helen clarify that it's not her fault. This is all a misunderstanding. Tell me the way to have triplets. She still wanted triplets. After all, it was really enviable for a wealthy family to have triplets. Twins were very common nowadays, but triplets were very rare. Jessica frowned and sighed. I really don't know what you're talking about. Mrs. Livingstone sneered. Stop pretending. I've already done my research. In the past five years, there have suddenly been many triplets in New York. And all of those families are more or less related to yours. Chapter 648 The Way to Have Triplets Chapter 648 The Way to Have Triplets When Jessica heard this, her expression instantly changed. However, she suppressed her laughter and regained her calmness in an instant. Mrs. Livingstone, your words are a little frivolous. Before us, other families have had quadruplets, quintuplets, and sextuplets. They have all been on the news. Why are you only focusing on our triplets? When she said this, her voice was very low. She clearly did not want it to be made public. Mrs. Livingstone began to count. There are not many twins in wealthy families, let alone triplets. But in the past few years, there have been a total of seven pairs of triplets in wealthy families. The first is yours, the next is your second sister's, and then yours again. Your second sister even gave birth to quadruplets. Your family has a lot of children. Your mother gave birth to them. You and your second sister are also twins. We don't have any doubts, we only exclaim how awesome your genes are. However, following that, the Lloyds also gave birth to twins. The strange thing was that be it the man or the woman, there was no precedent of them having multiple births. When I asked around, I learned that the mother of the girl from the Lloyds was your mother's half-sister. It was only because the two of them did not live together since they were young that the outside world did not know about their relationship. At this point, Mrs. Livingstone smiled and continued, and, she explained the origins of the seven triplets clearly. In the end, she said, therefore, your family must have a way to have triplets. Tell me, I will never slander Helen outside in the future. Also, once she gets her dowry back, I can also share a portion of her shared assets with Thomas. When Helen got a divorce, she had only brought back her own dowry. But actually, her dowry and the Livingstones, assets had earned a lot of money over the years. Logically speaking, Helen should get a bonus. Unfortunately, the Livingstones did not give it to her. Helen was anxious to get a divorce and wanted to cut everything off and start a new life. She did not force it. Hearing Mrs. Livingstone's words, Jessica bit her lips and said after a while, Mrs. Livingstone, I don't know or understand anything you're saying. Triplets and twins are the same. It depends on genes. This also depends on fate. It was impossible for Jessica to reveal this secret. She had thought it through very clearly. Being able to have triplets was her younger sister's trump card to find a man again. As long as this trump card was around, she did not have to worry that no one would want to marry her. Seeing that she refused to speak and that other than the two of them, the other three pairs of triplets were not conspicuous, Mrs. Livingstone could not force her. 
She could only say angrily, all right, since you don't know what's good for you, don't blame us. With that, she left without explaining anything to Helen under the scrutiny of the crowd. Jessica looked at her back and took a deep breath. She felt that she had taken extra care of the Livingstones when it came to handling matters, but the Livingstones' current state was really disappointing. As she was thinking, she heard Nora say, there's nothing wrong with Helen's injuries. It's just a normal fracture. She'll be fine after resting for a while. I have some special ointment here that can heal her wounds faster. And, don't worry, this injury will not affect her future life. Nora's words were vague, but everyone present understood. Helen was fine. She could conceive. When Thomas was proven to have weak semen, Helen's reputation would have become better. However, if no one clarified, it was indeed difficult to say. Who knew if there was a problem with both of them? Now that Nora had said this, it was equivalent to guaranteeing that Helen did not have a problem. Therefore, the gazes around her instantly became more enthusiastic. Triplets. Jessica's heart warmed up. She walked to Nora and suddenly made up her mind. She grabbed her hand. Miss Smith, are you interested in having triplets with Mr. Hunt in the future? I have a way, Nora. She had already given birth to a pair of twins, and Xander was most likely her child. What else could she want? Three were enough. However, as she thought this, she narrowed her eyes and suddenly said, I wonder what your method is. Jessica looked around and finally leaned close to Nora's ear mysteriously. I have a medicine. I'll give it to you for free. Medicine. Nora was stunned and looked at her suddenly. Her heart skipped a beat. She suddenly asked, where did you get this medicine? Could she have given birth to triplets because of this medicine back then? Chapter 649 That Lunatic Hearing this, Jessica was stunned and did not answer for a moment. After a moment, she sighed. Actually, it was six years ago. I had once saved a lunatic. He was wearing ragged clothes and fainted from hunger on the way. Then, I gave him some food and some money. In order to repay me, that person gave me a formula. Jessica sighed. At first, I did not believe in that formula. I brought it home for my mother who knew a little about alternative medicine. After taking a look, she said that it was a divine medicine. Therefore, she got me to make a few pills. When we wanted children after marriage, we ate one pill and really gave birth to triplets. At this point, Jessica continued, later on, I gave it to my second sister. She also gave birth to triplets. However, my second sister was more greedy. She ate two during her second pregnancy, so she gave birth to quadruplets. Nora, this could still be controlled. She hesitated for a moment. What did that lunatic look like? At the mention of a crazy person, she thought of a possibility. It was old Maddie who was still in the hospital and being taken care of by Lily. Ever since old Maddie's food poisoning incident, he had been in the hospital. Later on, Nora taught Lily the method of acupuncture and asked her to continue treating old Maddie. Speaking of which, not only did Lily have to perform acupuncture on old Maddie regularly, but she also had to drug Quentin regularly. She also had to constantly do DNA tests and restore the DNA sequencing to its original state before using it to compare samples. She was really busy. Yes, remember to give Lily a raise. While Nora was thinking about this, Jessica said, he looked like a normal person. He looked quite dirty, but I didn't take a photo. Nora took out her phone and found old Maddie's photo to show her. Is this the person? Jessica looked at the disfigured person and immediately shook her head. No, the lunatic I saved spoke incoherently, but he wasn't disfigured. I still remember that there was a huge mole on his left cheek, and there was a strand of hair on the mole. Old Maddie had been disfigured more than 20 years ago. However, Jessica had saved the person six years ago. Six years ago was also the time when Nora was about to get pregnant. Nora suddenly asked, where did you save him? Jessica said, I was traveling in the country. It was in a small town, but as for where it was, I have to think about it, it seemed to be near California. California. Nora continued to ask, what about the time? When was the exact time six years ago? Jessica recalled carefully, six years ago, it should have been winter. Because I remember the madman's hair was frozen at the time. 
The clothes he wore were tattered. I even gave him my husband's down jacket. Yes, it was winter. My husband and I had gone out for our honeymoon. Winter. When Nora was pregnant, it was in the winter six years ago. This made her even more suspicious of what had happened. Jessica saw that she was asking so many questions and thought of how Nora had also come from California. When she saved him back then, that person also seemed on his way to California. She suddenly asked, is this related to you? Nora nodded. If I'm not wrong, it should be related to me. Justin suddenly said, Jessica, do you still have anything left of him? As the head of the hunts, it was difficult for the Stewarts to talk to Justin on normal days. Only someone at the level of her father-in-law could sit beside Justin and talk with him. Therefore, when he spoke, Jessica instantly became even more proactive. She thought about it carefully and suddenly said, Oh, the formula that person gave me back then is still here. It was written by hand. Formula. Nora and Justin looked at each other and said in unison, Can we take a look? Of course. Jessica said, But it's at the stewards. Should I go back and get it? No, it's fine. Nora decided to follow beside her. I'll come with you to get it. Jessica nodded without hesitation. In her impression, Nora could not have come to steal the formula for the triplets. After all, Nora was Dr. Zabe's disciple. Jessica trusted her medical skills very much. After settling Helen down, Justin let her stay in the VIP ward and even sent someone to protect her to prevent Thomas from harassing her. After settling all of this, Jessica drove in front and Justin followed behind her with Nora. The two cars left the hospital and went straight to the stewards. On the way, Justin drove while Nora stared ahead and suddenly asked, How are Cherry and Xander getting along? Chapter 650 It's her. Justin smiled. They haven't met yet. Nora. She turned her head hesitantly and heard Justin say, Ever since Cherry came back, Xander has been hiding upstairs. He got the butler to deliver to his room. He has been acting suspiciously every day for God knows what, I didn't bother with him too much. Before confirming Xander's identity, Justin's feelings for this child were still complicated. On the one hand, he was disgusted by the sudden appearance of a child. On the other hand, this child might be his and Norris. Even if it was not Norris, it should probably be his. Therefore, he could not hate the child. There were even times when he looked into the child's pure eyes and felt that Xander could still be saved. Perhaps this child was not as bad as Truman in his bones. After all, he was only five years old. In such a complicated situation, if he did not want to interact with Cherry, Justin would not force him. Nora was silent for a moment. Are you sure they haven't met yet? Justin was about to answer yes when he suddenly paused and pursed his lips. At least they hadn't met before I went out. Nora rubbed her forehead. Yes, I guess they will meet now. She knew Cherry too well. The little fellow was definitely not the obedient type. She would definitely be very curious if there was a child living upstairs. Justin. He immediately became nervous. That child, Xander, has a bad temper and a foul mouth. Would he bully Cherry? No, I have to call and get the butler to take a look. Before he could pick up his phone, Nora pressed his hand down and sighed silently. Forget it. It's not certain who will bully whom. Justin. His daughter was so soft and obedient, how could she bully others? Nora rolled her eyes. It seemed like Justin still did not understand the little demon's nature. If she were that obedient, why would Nora be so strict with her? However, when the little demoness faced the little devil, she wondered who was stronger between Cherry and Xander. Suddenly, she was a little curious. Nora smirked. Just as she was thinking about it, she saw Justin say, No, I still have to make a call. Cherry is a girl. She can't be wronged. Nora. Originally, it was not certain who would win between Cherry and Xander, but if there was a father to pull the strings, then Cherry would definitely be able to suppress Xander, right? Justin went to make a call, but Nora ignored him. After the call, the group arrived at the stewards. When they saw them coming over in a grandiose manner, especially when Justin drove into the stewards' house, the stewards instantly became nervous and trembled top to bottom. Mrs. Stewart was very nervous when she saw this. 
The soft-hearted woman held Jessica's hand and asked carefully, why is Mr. Hunt here? Jessica looked at Nora helplessly. They have something to discuss. Mom, where's that prescription from back then? Take it out and let Miss Smith and Mr. Hunt take a look. Mrs. Stewart nodded and went upstairs. Soon, she came down with a formula in her trembling hands. She handed the formula to Nora respectfully. When she handed it to her, she was still saying, Miss Smith, thank you so much for helping Helen. Without your help, Helen definitely wouldn't have been able to get rid of this marriage. If you want this formula, then take it. However, you shouldn't take too much of this medicine. Damn it, look at me. You're an alternative medicine doctor yourself. What else can I say? Look at the prescription yourself and you should understand. It's best if you only take one pill every time. Your family already has twin genes. One pill can help you give birth to triplets. Don't take too many. Having too many children is very bad for the mother. Nora took the formula. After opening it and seeing the words, she was stunned. It was her. Chapter 651 of Et's Words. The note should have been written a long time ago. The edges had been worn down to the point of being dilapidated. It had been protected very well by the stewards. The piece of paper was probably very old. It was slightly yellowish as if it would disintegrate with a light tug. Nora was silent for a moment before suddenly asking, Can I have this piece of paper? Jessica sensed Nora's expression and knew that the matter seemed to be a little serious. She said, Sure. Actually, we have already recorded the formula on this piece of paper. We kept this piece of paper to commemorate. It. This piece of paper was meaningless to the stewards. Nora nodded. She carefully folded the piece of paper following the creases and placed it in her pocket. When she looked up again, she looked at Jessica and thanked her. Jessica said, I should be the one thanking you. However, please keep this between us. If everyone came looking for their secret medicine, it would be troublesome. Nora understood, so she nodded. She did not stay long with Justin. Before leaving, Justin suddenly stopped in his tracks and looked at Jessica. If there's anything in the future, you can directly come to me. This was a promise Justin made to her. After all, although Nora had helped the stewards, it was hard for Jessica to take out the formula to repay her. Now that Jessica was being so cooperative, the hunts could not ignore them. Furthermore, if Jessica did not give the formula to Mrs. Livingstone, she would probably become enemies with them. Justin's words were also a promise to the stewards for their protection. The hunts would not stand on the Livingstones, sighed. Jessica heaved a sigh of relief. The reason she was so cooperative was that she hoped that the hunts and Smith would not interfere in this matter. The Stuarts and her husband's family were not afraid of the Livingstones. What they had always been afraid of were the hunts. After leaving, Nora remained silent. After getting into the car, Justin did not ask her why her expression was serious and only asked, where are we going? Nora was silent for a moment before replying, the Andersons. Justin paused for a moment and drove straight to the Andersons. When they arrived at the Andersons, Melissa was a little surprised. Nora, why are you back so soon? Did something happen? Nora's expression was better now. Or rather, she had always been expressionless. Therefore, at this moment, she was expressionless. The people from the Andersons did not notice either. Nora said, I came to see Grandma. Although Mrs. Anderson's eyes had recovered, she was still old. All kinds of things had happened to her body, and it had worsened with age. Therefore, Nora would visit her every once in a while. She felt that her words were flawless. However, Melissa glanced at Justin, who was following behind her, and lowered her eyes. Okay, go. Nora went upstairs and Justin sat on the sofa downstairs. This was the Andersons, house, after all. He could not go upstairs at will. There were many women at the Andersons. It was not like the Smiths where he had his own room. He had just sat on the sofa when Melissa suddenly sat opposite him and said, Justin, there are a few things I'm not sure if I should say. Justin immediately sat up straight. Justin had always admired the Andersons. Yvette was an admirable figure in the past, and the Andersons had not lost their pride all these years. Although they could not compare to the Hunts in terms of business, they had always been in the lead in the pharmaceutical industry. 
Melissa was a scholar and also a well-known painter. He would often visit the Andersons when she was in California. Hearing Melissa's sudden serious tone, he said humbly, please speak. Melissa lowered her eyes. You should know Nora's temper and character as well. She's not one of those gentle women who stay at home. She has a huge drive and can go even further than her mother back then. You know this, right? Justin nodded. I know. I never wanted her to feel trapped. Others tied their wives down, but it was impossible for him to do so. Even if she became Madam Hunt, Nora would not be his accessory. But why would Melissa suddenly say such things? As he was thinking, Melissa said, Yes, I heard you have an illegitimate child. Justin. He understood. Although Nora had acted very normal earlier, Melissa had still caught her mood immediately. She had pretended not to see it. Now, she was knocking him down. Although not many people knew that he had an illegitimate child, there were still quite a few. Melissa had probably heard some rumors. He hurriedly said, I haven't confirmed it. Melissa looked at him, huh? Justin suddenly felt like he was facing his mother-in-law. He hurriedly explained, we haven't confirmed if that child is mine yet, but don't worry. I've already dealt with the person who pretended to be his mother. Also, I don't think it'll make things difficult for Nora because of him in the future. Melissa then heaved a sigh of relief. Nora has a cold personality and is not suitable to take care of children. The hunts are very busy. It's not like we can't afford to raise a child. Us Andersons and Smiths are not petty either. Melissa had long guessed that if Justin had an illegitimate child, he was probably schemed against. To be honest, this was not Justin's fault. After all, the children between Justin and Nora seemed to have been schemed against. Melissa could tolerate him raising a child outside. After all, it was too unreasonable to stop a father from raising a five-year-old child. However, this child could not appear in front of Nora and disturb her. Hearing Justin's guarantee, Melissa frowned. Was Nora a little frustrated? Was she frustrated about this? Upstairs, Nora checked Mrs. Anderson's pulse and confirmed that she was fine. Then, she went out and entered the room she had stayed in after returning to New York. That room belonged to Yvette. After entering, she went straight to the study and took out the medical book Yvette used to read. There were many notes on it, all written by Yvette. She took out the piece of paper she had brought with her and unfolded it. Then, she looked at the words on the paper. Yvette's writing was extremely aggressive. She always liked to draw the last stroke very long. Her handwriting was unique and different from others. When she turned a corner, she liked to draw an extra arc. After careful comparison, she finally came to a conclusion. The words on the paper were indeed written by her mother, Yvette. Chapter 652 How did she get pregnant back then? The words were from Yvette, but it did not mean that the person who had schemed against her back then was Yvette. However, it meant that the lunatic at least knew Yvette. The person who had schemed against her for her pregnancy back then was definitely Truman. Otherwise, Ruth would not have had a photo of her and Justin. Furthermore, if her mother's person had schemed against her to get her pregnant, then it was impossible for Truman to know the entire truth. Nora frowned. Her head was filled with confusion. What happened back then was like a mystery. What was going on? Why was her mother's formula in the hands of that old man? And did she give birth to twins or triplets back then? At this moment, her questions were like a tangled ball of thread that could not be resolved. Nora took a deep breath and suppressed the confusion in her heart. She then walked out of the door and went downstairs. She realized that Justin was sitting on the sofa with a serious expression while Melissa was also looking amiable. The two of them should have had a pleasant conversation just now. Nora greeted Melissa before leaving the Andersons with Justin. When he saw Nora's gaze, Justin stood up and went out with her. The man sat in the driver's seat again. Melissa then heaved a sigh of relief. She smiled and watched as the two of them left. When she went upstairs, she saw that Mrs. Anderson was standing by the window, staring at their departing figures. Melissa saw the worry on Mrs. Anderson's face and could not help but say, Mom, Mr. Hunt seems to be very good to Nora. You should be relieved. Why are you still so worried? 
Mrs. Anderson sighed. I'm just afraid that one day, Nora will suddenly disappear like Yvette. Melissa was taken aback. Mrs. Anderson lowered her eyes. Back then, Ian treated Yvette like this too. The two of them were childhood sweethearts and had a good relationship, but Yvette disappeared just like that. Back then too, Yvette and Ian had just returned home. At that time, Yvette ran into something and her face flashed with a daze. Then, she went missing. Mrs. Anderson held her chest. I always have a bad feeling. Melissa looked at Mrs. Anderson, not knowing what to say. Dash. At this moment, in the distant car, Nora told Justin of her discovery. If Truman schemed against us, what role did my mother play in this? Also, why did we have to have twins or triplets? Nora thought that she was joking. Unfortunately, when she turned around to look, she saw that Justin's expression was grave and did not catch the joke in her words. She asked hesitantly, what's wrong? Justin sighed silently. Nora, have you ever thought that perhaps your pregnancy was not due to artificial insemination? Nora was stunned. What do you mean? Did you think of something? Justin nodded. Recently, I've been having a dream. In the dream, I seem to have returned to that night. Me and A. Justin hesitated for a moment before continuing, a slightly plump woman slept together. A slightly plump woman. Nora immediately said, that's definitely not me. Justin. Nora said, back then, I weighed almost 200 pounds. I wasn't just a little. Plump. Justin. The woman who had slept with him back then was a fatty. But could he say fatty? If he said it, Nora would definitely fight him to the death. He coughed. I meant slightly plump and about 200 pounds. Nora. She immediately glanced at Justin in disdain. Then your standards for being slightly plump are a little low. Justin felt like he was being looked down on. The corners of his mouth twitched, and he finally sighed. He finally understood. In Nora's eyes, being fat meant being fat. She was not like other women. She would not even let him say that she was slightly plump and would get angry if he did. Justin was about to speak when Nora suddenly looked at him warily. Everyone says that people gain weight when they are middle-aged, especially men in their 30s. When the time comes, you won't reach your slightly plump standard. Justin. Was he being despised? The corners of his mouth twitched. He was about to say something when he heard Nora continue, if you weigh 200 pounds, your body will have a huge problem. Justin instantly heaved a sigh of relief, feeling that Nora was concerned about him. However, she continued, when you're 200 pounds, you can't lie on your stomach when you sleep. It's uncomfortable pressing against your heart, but it's too tiring to sleep in the same posture. Therefore, it's better to be skinnier. Justin was stunned. He felt that he would never be able to keep up with her thoughts. After Nora finished talking, the woman changed the topic again. So, whatever Truman said about the pregnancy might be a lie. We might also have gotten pregnant naturally. Justin nodded. Nora was even more confused. She felt like there were a few more knots in that mess. But in that case, did Truman scheme for us to be together? Or did my mother? Previously, she had felt that her mother had schemed against her to get her pregnant and could not accept it. However, after learning that her mother had sacrificed herself to save her, Nora's thinking had changed. Perhaps at that time, in her mother's eyes, her life was more important than anything. Truman said that she would have died if she hadn't given birth. If this was really the reason, she could accept that her mother had arranged for her to get pregnant. But if it was arranged by his mother, how did Truman take over? How did Xander end up in his hands? She frowned. As she was thinking, she realized that the car had already entered the Hunt Manor. She raised her eyebrows hesitantly and heard Justin say, Don't you want to see how Cherry and Xander Yale are doing? His voice was very friendly when he mentioned Cherry. When Xander was mentioned, he said his full name. Nora pursed her lips. I really want to know. The two of them stopped the car at the entrance. Someone came over and drove the car to the parking lot. The two of them walked into the living room. Nora subconsciously sped up. She really wanted to see how the two children interacted. Pete had always given in to Cherry. Cherry had also been very tolerant of Pete because she had looked forward to meeting her brother since she was young. 
As long as Pete did not touch her game, the two little fellows would be very loving. However, Cherry might not be patient with others. The two of them had just entered when they heard a commotion in the room. Chapter 653 Old Maddie is awake. I'm so angry, I'm so angry. Jumbo, are you fighting with a wild beast? You stayed in the jungle for so long, don't you see that the middle lane has already opened up? There's so much HP, are you blind? Although Cherry was very fierce when she scolded people in her childish voice, it was funny to see her dancing on the sofa. I think he might be a Buddhist who can't bear to kill. Xander stood behind Cherry's sofa and played the supporting role. Cherry rolled her eyes and turned around with her back to Xander. It was obvious that she did not want to talk to him. Can you shut up? Xander stuck out his tongue and closed his eyes. He stood there obediently. Cherry continued the next group battle. Jumbo. I'm an ADC, do you know what an ADC is? Why are you stealing from my minions? Don't you know I'm looking for more resources? She had just finished complaining when Xander said again, this guy probably died of poverty in his previous life, so he wants whatever money he sees in this life. Cherry was in a fit of anger. She nodded immediately. You have a point. However, as soon as she finished speaking, she suddenly realized who had said those words. Cherry immediately rolled her eyes and glanced at Xander. She tilted her head and said in a childish voice, Can you not talk to me? Xander stabbed his elbows into the sofa and hung his chin. His chubby face was held in his hands. But there's only you and me in this house. If I don't talk to you, who will I talk to? Cherry, the butler. Tisk, I'm not talking to him. Xander continued to look at Cherry. I just want to talk to you. Cherry, she rolled her eyes again and stood up from the sofa. She strode upstairs with Xander following behind her. What are you going to do? Cherry, I'll play upstairs. Xander nodded. I think it's quieter upstairs too. It's too noisy with people coming and going downstairs. The two of them went up to the second floor one after another and arrived in front of Cherry's room. Cherry walked in and Xander was about to follow when Cherry suddenly turned around and looked into the distance. Daddy. Xander suddenly looked over but realized that there was no one there. He turned around to see Cherry's door close with a bang. Xander. The door almost hit his nose. He touched his nose. That appearance was really identical to how Justin usually looked when he felt uncomfortable. Why was Cherry so angry? She was not as cute as she was on the internet. As Xander thought about this, he pursed her lips. Then, just as he was about to knock on the door, he heard footsteps downstairs. When he turned around and saw Nora and Justin coming upstairs, he immediately strode forward and rushed into his room. Bang. The door closed. Xander was prepared to sleep. Sigh. He sighed silently. Before he returned to the country, Truman had said that the woman beside Justin was very annoying, so Xander hated Nora. However, who would have thought that Nora was the mother of his only friend? What should he do now? He originally wanted to tease Nora. But if he did that now, would his only good friend really cut ties with him? Xander placed his arms behind his head and lay on the bed staring at the ceiling in frustration. Outside the room, Justin raised his eyebrows and said, Why do I feel like Xander is avoiding you? Really? Nora touched her face. I'm not that scary, am I? However, it was quite strange that the two children did not quarrel. She did not know what had happened previously. As Nora thought about this, she and Justin looked at each other and then went their separate ways. Nora went to Cherry's room. Justin went to Xander's room, planning to probe. Nora had just entered when she saw that Cherry had finished her game and was video calling Pete. The little girl lay on the bed, her legs swaying. Pete, that Xander really looks identical to Daddy. He keeps trying to curry favors with me. Fortunately, I listened to you and realized his goal long ago. I ignored him. Pete, okay, keep ignoring him. Cherry, I've asked around. Everyone says that he's the illegitimate child of Dad and another woman. He must have a reason to curry favor with you, so this person can't stay. Otherwise, Mom will be very sad. We have to firm our resolve. As if she was doing a spy mission, Cherry nodded. Pete, don't worry. Although he fawns on me in every way and his words are indeed quite nice, I won't be bewitched by his sweet talk. 
Daddy can have other babies apart from you and me, but this baby has to be born from mommy. Otherwise, he'll be our enemy. We can't be good to him or be soft-hearted to him. Or else we'll be betraying mommy. It was as if she was talking to Pete and herself. In fact, after her father left today, Cherry had sneaked upstairs with the intention of messing with this little demon. After all, she had heard that on the day she was not around, the little demon had bullied several servants in the house. He even bit the hand of her favorite bodyguard. How detestable. She had to teach this lousy child a lesson. Therefore, she had secretly entered Xander's room with a spider in her hand. When she pushed the door open, she realized that the person, who looked like her father, was sleeping on the bed. She smiled and walked over to place the spider in Xander's hand, wanting to scare him. The spider in her hand was big, as big as a thumb, but it did not bite or poison. Cherry did not plan to hurt him. She just wanted to scare him. When the spider crawled on her arm, Xander seemed to have sensed it. He slowly opened his eyes and raised his arm. When he saw the spider, Xander was indeed frightened. He screamed, his face turning white. Cherry felt that it was about time. After all, she couldn't scare him to death. She was about to take the spider away when she saw. Xander seemed to be frightened. His other hand suddenly grabbed the spider, and then. He stuffed the spider into his mouth. He stuffed it into his mouth. In his mouth, Cherry was shocked. She looked at him with wide eyes. Xander took two bites and said calmly, it tastes good, but it's a little hard. Find a soft one next time. Cherry. She was bewildered. The little demoness who had been making trouble and bullying others since she was young was stunned by this unpredictable little demon in front of her. Cherry was dumbfounded. After a moment, she rushed toward Xander with a loud shout and reached out to poke his mouth. Return my spider to me. She's my pet. That's right. She had raised that spider. Otherwise, she wouldn't know so much. But unexpectedly, Xander had eaten it. Cherry was furious. Then, she saw Xander look at her. Then should I spit it out for you? As he said this, he planned to reach into his throat and even made a disgusting retching gesture. Cherry was a little princess who loved cleanliness. She hurriedly jumped out of bed and took a few steps back. Xander did not spit out anything. Instead, he smiled at Cherry. Cherry knew that she had been tricked. She cried out loud. It was not because she had been deceived, nor was she at a disadvantage. It was because her little pet was gone. She did not want to care about this stinky boy anymore. Hey, why are you crying? Xander was anxious. He jumped out of bed and was about to comfort Cherry when she suddenly opened her mouth and bit Xander's arm. Xander. When he saw Cherry's tearless eyes, he knew that he had been tricked too. The pain in his arm made him cry out, Hey, let go. Are you a dog? However, Cherry did not let go at all. She wanted to take revenge for her pet spider. Xander was furious. He suddenly said, If you don't let go, I'll crush your spider to death. Hearing this, Cherry was stunned. She looked up and saw Xander reaching out with his other hand. His chubby hand slowly opened, and her spider was lying on his palm. Cherry. Cherry ignored him. However, Xander found her amusing and followed her downstairs. Cherry played games and scolded people in-game, so Xander played along and said a few words. When it came to scolding, Pete had never been able to say it, so it made Cherry feel a little warm. Furthermore, it felt like two swords had combined. At the thought of this, she shook her head suddenly. She slapped her head. Cherry, what are you thinking about? How could she have a good impression of that bad child, Xander? She had to dislike him. Because liking him would be betraying her mother. Cherry tried to build up her emotions, but she could not help but say, Pete, Xander doesn't seem that bad. Pete. Oh no. His sister had been corrupted. Pete was silent for a moment before suddenly saying, I'll come back tomorrow. He could not let his sister be abducted by a bad child. Cherry nodded. She was about to say something when Nora entered. She hurriedly hung up the phone. When she turned back, she saw Nora looking at her tentatively. Cherry immediately blinked her large grape-like eyes and flew into her arms. Mommy, why are you here? Did you feel that Cherry missed you? Her little mouth was like honey. 
Nora rubbed her head and was about to ask her how she was getting along with Xander when her phone suddenly rang. She lowered her head and saw that Lily was calling. Boss, old Maddie is awake. He said that he has something to say to you. Old Maddie had woken up. Coincidentally, Nora wanted to ask him about the triplets. Chapter 654 Twins are triplets. Nora hung up the phone and looked at Cherry. After a moment's thought, she nevertheless gave her a reminder. Don't bully the boy. Cherry nodded at once, the very picture of a well-behaved girl. She replied, don't worry, mommy. Xander and I will get along very well. For some reason, when she saw how she was behaving, Nora was entirely unconvinced. But if Cherry was refusing to say it, then she couldn't possibly force her to, right? As such, she let Cherry stay obediently in the room while she went out. When she did, she happened to bump into Justin, who was coming out of Xander's room. When the two met, Nora raised her eyebrows and asked, how did it go? Justin looked a little awkward. He said that he's getting along very well with Cherry and told me not to worry. Nora, she had obviously seen the two little fellows being awkward around each other, so how could they possibly be having fun? But both of them were refusing to tell the truth. Do you believe him? She asked. Justin kept quiet for a while before he suddenly replied, whether the children are fated to get along or not is out of our hands. There are siblings who have trouble getting along. Let's not force it. He was afraid that Nora would tell Cherry to treat Xander better, which might instead make the children rebellious. Nora had always taken an easygoing and stress-free approach to raising. If Cherry liked playing games, then she would let her play. Of course, this was also because of Cherry's unique character. It definitely wouldn't do for other children to become as addicted as Cherry was to games. However, Cherry's IQ was too high. She had to use games and play with Barbie dolls to calm down her hyperactive brain. Since Justin had put it that way, she nodded and walked out of the Hunt Manor. When she was going down the stairs, she suddenly turned and looked back, upon which she saw a small head quickly darting backward in Xander's room as though he was afraid of being seen by her. Nora withdrew her gaze, though a faint indescribable emotion welled up in her. However, she quickly suppressed the emotion. She didn't want her judgment to become impaired because of her emotions. Before she could be sure of whether Xander was her son or not, it was better that she had less contact with him, lest she developed feelings for him. If that happened, things would become troublesome. She wasn't the only one who thought that way. As Justin walked her to the parking lot, even he himself suddenly said calmly, for Truman to send the child back so easily, yet not for the purpose of saving Ruth, something must be wrong. Although it is highly likely from a DNA perspective that Xander is our son, until we can confirm it, we must not be soft-hearted. Nora, who knew what he meant, nodded. After leaving Justin's villa, she started to drive out of the manor. However, someone stopped her while she was on the way out. With a frown, Nora stopped the car and looked at the hunts, housekeeper who had stopped her. The housekeeper was looking at her with a smile. She said, Ms. Smith, ma'am invites you over to her place. Nora cast her eyes down and suddenly smiled. Sorry, but I'm not free. As soon as she said that, the housekeeper's expression instantly changed. She looked at Nora in surprise, upon which she saw a glint of indifference bursting forth from the woman's cat-like eyes. She started the car and drove forward. Fanny, the housekeeper, had been working for Mrs. Hunt for many years and had been taking care of the Hunt Manor for several decades. She was highly respected in the manor, and even Justin generally treated her a little more politely than others. Fanny didn't expect Nora to be this rude to her. The 60-year-old Fanny frowned. Just as she was about to speak, she realized that Nora was really driving off. She could only step aside and say, Ms. Smith, please wait a minute. I'm doing this for your sake. I doubt you want to put Pete in a spot, right? Nora, she let go of the gas pedal. The car came to a halt. Fanny followed beside the car and went on. Ms. Smith, it won't do for you to continue taking things so seriously with ma'am like this. After all, she's your elder. If you give in, ma'am definitely won't make things difficult for you, either. Take Mr. Livingstone's illness this time for example. 
If you take the initiative to cure Thomas's condition, and get the baby-making formula from the Stuarts you've done them such a huge favor this time, so they will definitely give it to you when that happens, you will be the Livingstone's benefactor. Ma'am will definitely remember what you've done for them. This way, Pete won't have to be caught between his great-grandmother and his mother too, right? Nora knew it. Fanny must have come to her to get her to treat Thomas's condition. She scoffed and looked at Fanny. You want me to treat Thomas's condition? Sure. Seeing her relent so easily, Fanny smiled and said, I knew Miss Smith is a smart person. I'm sure you won't want to make things difficult for Mr. Hunt either. In that case, when can you treat Mr. Livingstone's illness? Nora replied casually, Oh, I'm not sure about that because you'll have to get an appointment. You can contact my assistant and talk to her about it. After saying that, she stepped on the gas pedal right away. The car zoomed forward at once, puffing dust into Fanny's face. Fanny. It was then that she realized that she had been tricked. If she went to her assistant to get an appointment, God knows how long they would have to wait. Everyone knew how good Auntie's medical skills were, so they all went to her for medical consultations. However, Auntie only accepted two patients a month, so there was a huge line at Lily's at the moment. Thomas really did want to have his condition treated. However, Mrs. Hunt had already gotten people to ask around if they were to really join the queue, they would have to wait for at least 10 years. By then, Thomas would be nearly 40. What was the point of having his illness treated then? Fanny stamped her foot angrily. When she returned to the villa, Mrs. Hunt was sighing. She said, I owe her big this time. Sigh, never mind, if she performs well in the future, then I'll just stop making things difficult for her. But as soon as she said that, she instead saw a troubled-looking Fanny. Mrs. Hunt was stunned. S. He didn't agree to it. Fanny nodded. Mrs. Hunt smacked the sofa angrily, her expression instantly becoming awful. She clutched her chest, so angry that she actually couldn't breathe for a moment. Fanny hurriedly gave her a Zabe Corporation's calming pill. A short while after she took it, she finally felt like she could breathe again. She said, how dare she refuse? This is so maddening. Mrs. Hunt took a deep breath. How dare she disrespect me again and again? It seems that I really have to teach her a lesson. Nora was completely unaware that she had infuriated Mrs. Hunt. She had already arrived at the hospital by then. Lily was waiting for her at the door. Nora asked, when did he recover? Lily lowered her voice and said, actually, he was already showing signs of it two days ago. He had stopped making a din or kicking up a fuss, so I think he had likely already recovered at that time. He looked more like he was observing his surroundings at that time, and seemed to be full of hostility. It was only today that he finally said that he wanted to see you. Nora nodded and entered the ward with Lily. Old Maddie was seated on the bed. The burns on his face made him look extraordinarily scary. His entire face was flat with two holes in the area where his eyes were supposed to be. There were also two holes at his nose, and his outer lips were gone. He was completely disfigured. Previously, when he was crazy, he had looked a little more pleasing to the eye. But now that he was no longer crazy and had calmed down, he actually felt scarier. If a child stumbled into the room and saw him, they would probably burst into tears out of fright. After Nora entered the room, old Maddie stared at her hard with his beady eyes. A long while later, he sighed and said, you two really look alike. Two alike. You practically look just like Yvette. Nora didn't care about that. She immediately voiced her biggest concern at the moment. Last time, you said that I needed to have children. In that case, did I give birth to twins or triplets? Chapter 655 Why she would die if she didn't have children. Nora stared hard at old Maddie to look at his reaction after she voiced the question. She would never trust a person's words that easily, so she wanted to determine whether he was telling the truth through his reaction. What she didn't expect, though, was that because of the burns on old Maddie's face, he couldn't make any facial expressions. Even his eyes were too small for her to see anything. This made him hard to read. Old Maddie kept quiet for a while. Suddenly, he asked, Twins. Triplets. What are you talking about? Didn't you only give birth to a daughter? 
In old Maddie's impression, the daughter of the lady he served had returned and gave birth to a daughter. How could it have been twins or triplets instead? Seeing how logical his answer was, Nora frowned. Uncle. I'm not worthy of having you call me that. Old Maddie interrupted her and said, My name is Jake Reed. I am your mother's subordinate, and you are the young lady whom I now serve. Seeing that he had brought up her mother again, Nora asked, What on earth happened back then? Old Maddie heaved a sigh. Your mother was tricked into doing human research by a mysterious organization back then. When she realized what was happening, she hurriedly ran away from the organization. However, that organization was simply too powerful. In order to avoid implicating your father, your mother staged an elopement and made everyone think that she had betrayed your father. Then, she left New York and went to a small town in California. At that time, she only took me with her. Old Maddie's explanation was simple, but it matched the story that Nora had previously heard. And then, she asked. Then, your mother found someone with the last name Smith Henry Smith. I think and pretended to marry him. The two of them then lived in secret in California. Do you know why she went to Henry? Nora had a guess, but she didn't say it. Old Maddie then said, because she wanted you to have the last name, Smith. Even if you couldn't grow up under your real father's love and care, she still wanted you to keep your real last name. It was just like what she had thought. Her mother must have been deeply in love with Ian back then. That was why the tiny company she had founded in California was named Idealian Pharmaceuticals. Nora did not comment on the love between her parents. Instead, she listened quietly. Old Maddie went on, but later, she was still discovered by the mysterious organization. Because I had never made an appearance in front of others, she told me to leave and hide somewhere. Then, once you turned 20, I was supposed to tell you that you must have a baby. He continued. I had no friends or relatives and had been working for your mother the whole time. I didn't know what I should do during all those years, either. Moreover, I knew that your mother was in danger, so I had only one thought in my mind, and that was to look for your father. The Smiths were strong and powerful. If there was someone who could save your mother, it was your father. But on my way to New York, I encountered people from the mysterious organization. They injured me. Old Maddie seemed to be recalling the events from back then. He said, after that, my mind was in a state of confusion. All I knew was that I had to go to New York to look for your father, but I forgot why I had to do that. I also kept your mother's order strictly in mind, that was, to tell you that you must have a baby before you turn 20. Nora had been stunned the moment old Maddie mentioned that she had to have a baby. Upon hearing him bringing it up again, even though she knew that she shouldn't be interrupting him at this time, judging from his demeanor, he should have already finished the story. There was nothing after that. Thus, she finally couldn't stop herself from asking, why did I have to have a baby? Old Maddie heaved a huge sigh. Because, you would have died if you hadn't. Nora became more confused. Truman had also told her the same thing. He had told her that she would have died if she hadn't had a baby. At that time, she had been dubious about his answer, but Truman had said that he was telling the truth. Later on, however, she discovered that what he had said was only half true. Nora had always wanted to know why she had to have a baby back then. It seemed that, be it her mother or Truman, both of them had made that choice for her. But, why? Thinking about this, she asked, why? Nora knew that the answer would finally be revealed today. Chapter 656 to 6 The Truth Nora narrowed her eyes and looked at old Maddie intently. There was silence in the ward. Lily had left the room when the two started talking, and was standing guard outside the door. The white-walled ward seemed completely silent. Apart from tranquility, there was only the smell of pungent disinfectant in the air. But be it old Maddie or Nora, both of them were very used to such a smell. The former had stayed there for a very long time by then and had already become accustomed to the smell, while the latter had pretty much grown up being bathed in the smell. When she was in poor health as a child, she was often hospitalized. Her bedroom at home would also be sanitized with disinfectants. Nora lowered her eyes slightly. Then, old Maddie said, after you were born, your mother discovered that the mysterious organization was in pursuit of her. 
In order to ensure your survival, she died before the mysterious organization's eyes, so that they won't continue investigating. But we all knew that they definitely won't stop. Besides, no one could say for sure whether the Greys were trustworthy or not. Old Maddie looked at her. It's only when you become strong enough that you can resist becoming someone else's pawn. Your mother was driven into a corner at that time was because she was not strong enough. Not strong enough. Nora was taken aback. Yvette could stir up the entire New York and throw it into instability back then. The drugs she developed even in this age after more than 20 years had gone by were still relevant. She was multi-talented. To this day, she was still a legend in New York. Yet someone like her was not strong enough. Moreover, even now, Nora did not feel that the mysterious organization was that powerful. In the United States, they had been completely suppressed by the special department. Truman had even almost been arrested. In the end, he had to leave the country in a pathetic state to seek refuge abroad. So, had her mother made the wrong choice back then? Would they really have been that fearsome if she had joined hands with Ian? Besides, why didn't her mother seek asylum from the authorities? These were all mysteries. She wanted to ask something, but old Maddie had already continued, in order to give you the ability to defend yourself, and in order to give you enough confidence to face these things that you are facing today, she had no choice but to inject you with, a serum. Norris back suddenly became ramrod straight. What? Surprise flashed across her eyes. But right after, it became a look of realization. To be honest, she had already guessed as much that she had also been injected with a gene serum. When Lily was checking her DNA some time back, she had discovered that her IQ genes had mutated a little. This was also the reason why the DNA comparison between her and Ian had only reached 98% and not the benchmark for a father-daughter similarity. Perhaps because he saw that she had become a little agitated, old Maddie hurriedly waved and said, it was just a little. A little. Your father and your mother are already some of the most intelligent people in the world, so their daughter's IQ could never be low. That's why your mother only injected you with very little serum. There was only a bit of difference in your DNA comparison with Ian, right? Nora nodded. It was medically recognized that a father-daughter pair's genes should be 99.8% similar, but hers and Ian's were only 98% similar. This indicated that a 1% change had indeed occurred. Moreover, the change had even occurred in the IQ gene. So, it was because she had also been injected with the gene serum that she was so smart and was able to master so many things easily. While she was contemplating, old Maddie spoke again. However, that serum has a side effect. Has your health always been poor? Nora fell silent. She had been frail since she was a child and often easily fell sick. She often visited the hospital and had poor immunity. The moment the weather changed, she would inevitably catch a cold. This had also given her stepmother a chance to give her hormonal injections, which had caused her to become fat. Therefore, even though she was a fatty a fatty who could fight and a fatty who was very smart her constitution was indeed poor. Additionally, Caleb was also in poor health. When she thought of him, all she could remember was the sight of him coughing his lungs out. As for Truman, his physical condition was currently unknown. Given how he had kept himself hidden all this time, it probably wasn't that great either. But what did this have to do with her having children? Could it be that? Nora's pupils shrank suddenly. Her head whipped up abruptly, upon which she heard old Maddie say, adults cannot withstand the gene serum's modification at all. Even if they succeed, they will only have two years left to live. Even if they don't die after two years, they will go crazy. Children's bodies have a high level of malleability, but even so, you likely wouldn't have been able to withstand even that bit of serum. Moreover, your IQ genes were close to being perfect in the first place, so the serum couldn't show that great an effect on you. That's why, before the age of 20, you needed to expel the excess dosage by giving birth. Nora was stunned. However, her first reaction was to ask, then what about the children? Will there be residual serum in the children? Old Maddie shook his head. We don't know. Your mother didn't have the time to verify that either. All she wanted was to protect you. I also brought this up to her at the time. Her answer to me was, 
Old Maddie kept quiet for a while before he sighed and said, It's her child. She will have to do something about them herself. Nora. She had to check immediately whether there was any mutation in Cherry and Pete's genes, as well as whether there was any residual gene serum in them. She stood up suddenly. As she looked at old Maddie, she asked another question, in that case, why did the father of my children have to be Justin Hunt? Old Maddie was taken aback. I wasn't the one who executed that part of the plan, so I'm not sure. Back then, apart from myself, your mother also had two other subordinates. Old Maddie had been crazy for so many years, so he definitely wouldn't know the details of Nora's pregnancy. In other words, if her mother was the one who had plotted her pregnancy, then it was likely the other two who had carried out the plan. She was about to ask when old Maddie said, one of them is Charles Ramsey while the other is Ivan Rogers. Charles is very recognizable, he has a mole on his face, and there's a strand of hair on the mole. Nora, wasn't that the lunatic Jessica had mentioned? She frowned and looked at old Maddie again. How do I contact Charles? Old Maddie sighed. The three of us didn't contact one another much. Besides, twenty years have already passed. Our contact methods may have become obsolete. Nora, however, said firmly, tell me. Old Maddie kept quiet for a moment before he said, for more than twenty years, we never told one another our cell phone numbers. It was always one way whenever we contacted one another. No matter which one of us it was, if we wanted to contact someone, we had to publish an ad in the newspaper and state clearly the number of a payphone and the time in the ad. When the other party saw it, they would find a payphone and call you. Norris' lip corners spasmed. Why were they contacting one another as if they were spies? And it sure was old-fashioned. Even the three of them were on guard against one another, what exactly was her mother doing back then? Why did she have three such subordinates? It seemed that she would have to talk to old Maddie about her mother's past again when she had time. If they didn't want the other party to know their phone number, couldn't they just encrypt it? She sighed. Tell me the contact method. Old Maddie nodded. After telling her about the contact method, he said, just publish it in the daily newspaper. That would be a hard thing to do. Most newspapers were published online these days, there weren't many physical copies anymore. Even if there were, hardly anyone would buy them these days. Old Maddie was also dumbfounded. What should we do? Nora held her forehead. I have a solution. But first, my last two questions. The first one is, do you know why they chose Justin Hunt as the children's father? Chapter 657 The Mystery of Xander's Birth Old Maddie said, I don't know why he was chosen, but your mother told us at the time to choose the smartest one. That's because the serum she gave you improved one's genes. Even if it was passed on to the child, their genes wouldn't be modified much if the child was born very smart. This way, if the serum is unable to do what it's supposed to, it will become ineffective. I would think that is likely the reason why. Nora. So, Justin had been chosen because of his high IQ. The corners of Nora's lips spasmed. But she felt that the answer didn't seem unacceptable either. After all, Cherry's IQ was slightly higher than Pete's, probably because half of a female's genes were inherited from the father. Then, here's my last question. Nora stared hard at old Maddie. If I gave birth to more children, would the amount of serum distributed to each child have become smaller, thereby making it safer for them? If her theory was correct, then she could conclude that she had indeed given birth to triplets. Her mother must have given her the triplet-making drug in order to let the three children share that bit of gene serum. If so, Xander would be her son. However, old Maddie suddenly smiled and answered, of course not. He sighed and said, your mother only injected you with a very low dosage of serum in the first place. The number of children you gave birth to didn't affect anything. It can be said that the serum could not bring much harm to the child after passing through your body. Nora was stunned. Why was the answer different from what she had imagined? She frowned, perplexed as to how things had turned out this way. While she was thinking, old Maddie spoke up again. Besides, your mother once said that the Andersons have genes for having twins, so it all depended on your luck. Whether you have twins or just one child, they are all still your children. 1111. Nora looked closely at old Maddie for a long while. 
In the end, she lowered her eyes. I see. She went out of the room to see Lily standing there and nodding off as she leaned against the wall. Nora asked, how long has it been since you last slept? Lily, who was taller than her, immediately replied, 20 hours, I guess. Nora uttered an, oh, and then said, get some rest. Those three words made Lily all excited, but unexpectedly, she then heard Nora say, once you're rested, try to restore Xander's DNA data as soon as possible. Lily, if she wanted it, as soon as possible, how was she going to get a good rest? She couldn't help but complain, boss, you are so impractical. Instead of saying so much, it's better that you just give me a pay raise instead. Nora looked at her curiously. Are you very short of money? Not really. Lily blinked and replied, it's mainly because it costs quite a lot to support young men. Besides, that man in question is even your cousin. Boss, how much do the Smiths give to Quentin each month? Can we negotiate a little and have them give him a bit less in the future? If not, I won't have enough to keep him as my mistress. Nora, she patted Lily on the shoulder. Then, she turned and left. When she returned to the Smiths, to her surprise, she found Samuel seated in the living room. Seeing her, he immediately came forward with an ingratiating smile and said, Nora, can you talk to Joel and have him release your grandaunt Sue? Nora, she looked at Joel, only to see him as smiley as ever as he said. Granduncle Samuel, what are you saying? Nora has nothing to do with this. As he spoke, he gave her a look. Nora went upstairs at once. In the corridor, she could still hear Samuel downstairs. He said, Joel, you can't do this. Sue did make a false police report, but it's already been so long. Shouldn't you let her out by now? I heard that you even talked to the police, so she's having a hard time inside. You can't treat her like this. Joel was still smiling at him. Granduncle Samuel, what are you talking about? I don't understand. You wolf in sheep's clothing, stop pretending. I know all about it. Samuel yelled angrily. Joel, however, remained as smiley as ever. Really? So, what do you know, Granduncle Samuel? Nora. She finally knew how Joel came to be known as a wolf in sheep's clothing. He was really good at frustrating people and making them feel as if everything they did was useless. And in private, not only was he merciless, but also vicious. She was sure that Joel was definitely the one behind Sue's continued imprisonment. It was like back then. After Hillary was imprisoned, she had been having a very hard time. Nora had wanted to punish her at the time, but when she looked into it, she found that both Carl and Joel had talked to the people inside. This led to Hillary's life inside becoming a living hell. This was also why she had been duped in the end the moment they gave her a bit of hope. Joel might look like a pushover, but in truth, he was secretly very vicious. Moreover, after Tanya poisoned Hillary and was falsely accused of murdering her, and then her name subsequently cleared again, someone had exhumed Hillary's grave. She was already dead, yet her corpse had been taken out of the grave and whipped, one could say that this was revenge for Mia. The woman who impersonated Jill also had a miserable end. She had attempted suicide several times in prison. It was just a pity that Joel would not allow her to die after all the wicked things she had done, so she hadn't been successful in killing herself all this time. Nora went upstairs and ignored the ongoings downstairs. It was just that after a while, she heard that Samuel had decided to withdraw from the company's board of directors and that he had also voluntarily given up some of his dividends to expand the ancestral graves and repair the Smith's ancestral home. Nora shook her head, feeling like Joel was really someone who got things done quietly and inconspicuously. However, she didn't care much about these affairs in the Smiths. After going upstairs, she posted a missing person notice in the online version of a newspaper. Because she had spent some money on it, the missing person notice was published right in that night's newspaper. As long as Charles was still alive, he would probably take the initiative to contact her when he saw the ad, right? After Nora was done, she leaned on the desk, her fingers tapping lightly against the desk as she waited quietly for the call. Old Maddie's recovery had allowed her to come one step closer to the truth. She had also received a great deal of information earlier in the day. 
the mystery of why she would have died if she hadn't had a baby had finally been solved. But when she thought of this, she hurriedly stood up and walked over to Pete. Pete, who was writing his assignments, sensed her presence. He raised his head and looked at her. What's the matter, mommy? Nora held his hand and said, nothing much. Just a routine check of your pulse. Pete looked at her quietly, his dark eyes filled with trust and love. This made Nora suddenly think of the split-second glance she had seen from Xander when she was at the Hunt Manor earlier that day. It seemed like there was a similar pair of innocent eyes looking at her at that time. A few hours after the ad in the newspaper was published, her cell phone suddenly rang. Nora looked over it was an unfamiliar number. Charles's call was here. The mystery of Xander's birth would finally be revealed. Chapter 658 Hello, Charles. Nora withdrew her hand that was checking Pete's pulse. Pete didn't have any major problems with his health. They were just some small problems typical of children. From the looks of it, the gene serum didn't have any effect on him. Nora was relieved. She narrowed her eyes and then answered the call. A low and deep male voice came from the other end. Hello, who are you? Nora frowned and identified herself at once. I am Nora Smith. You should know who I am, right? The call fell silent at once. Nora slowly said, Charles, I know you were my mother's subordinate. I have some questions for you. Perhaps because she had called him by name, Charles replied, I have nothing to say to you. He hung up right away after saying that. Nora stared at her cell phone and clenched her jaw. Why wasn't Charles talking? Was he hiding something? She picked up her cell phone and immediately started tracing the call to find out his location. Half an hour later, Nora paused when she saw Charles's location. She stood up, rushed out of the house, and drove straight to the hospital. That's right, Charles was in the hospital. After Nora rushed to the hospital and got out of the car, she immediately saw a group of nurses and doctors moving about in a hurry and busy at work. Ambulances arrived at the entrance of the hospital one after another. A lot of people in white lab coats were anxiously giving first aid to the victims being carried out of the ambulances. Their white clothes were dyed red, and some of the victims' blood had wet the white sheets, forming a shocking and harrowing sight. All the non-urgent passages in the hospital had been closed, and all the doctors had rushed over to deal with the victims of the traffic accident. Nora stood at the door and looked at her busy colleagues. She heard a doctor approaching and asking, what happened? Sigh, it's a long story. A bus got into a traffic accident. All 50-odd people in the bus are injured. Really, how did this happen all of a sudden? I'll take over the patient here, you can take care of the one over there. Although the doctors were flustered, they dealt with the victims in an orderly manner. The other patients also wisely stepped aside. When a real disaster occurred, everyone knew that life was more important than anything else. Beep, 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 a medical instrument started sounding a warning beep. Nora looked to the side and saw that an unsupervised victim had suddenly gone into shock. Upon hearing the warning beep, a panicked nurse shouted, Where is Dr. Wilson? Where is Dr. Wilson? A patient went into cardiac arrest just now, Dr. Wilson has gone over. The nurse was in a huge panic. This patient has gone into shock. What do we do now? Nora rushed over subconsciously. She was wearing a black shirt. She took a white lab coat from the side and put it on. Then, she walked over to the nurse and said, let me do it. You, who are you? The nurse looked at her dubiously. Are you a doctor? Nora's one-liner made the nurse shut up. I am Auntie. The name Auntie was most definitely a regal existence for people in the medical industry. Therefore, a look of joy came over the nurse's face at once. What should we do about this patient? Nora took a look at the patient and immediately instructed, start CPR at once. Inject 5 milliliters of. Perhaps because her voice was simply too calm and collected, the nurse gradually calmed down. Under her orders, she began to perform CPR on the patient. What came after that was a slew of first aid measures. At last, the patient's heartbeat returned to normal. Nora touched his abdomen and said, the patient has internal bleeding. Send him for surgery at once. Yes, doctor. 
Patients typically needed to go for x-ray sand on top of that, it wasn't even known which part of the body required x-rays before they could receive treatment. In the process of finding the cause of their illness, they ended up missing the most optimal treatment time. However, with just a casual touch, Nora had figured out the cause of the patient's condition, thereby speeding up the rescue process. This also saved them a lot of unnecessary trouble. After the first aid was completed, the people outside gradually dispersed. Most of the patients had also been categorized. Patients with minor or moderate injuries were currently resting in the corridor outside due to a lack of beds. As for patients with serious injuries, they had been pushed into the operating rooms. There were enough doctors in the hospital. Thus, after the initial panic, the order resumed and they started to provide medical treatment in an orderly manner. Nora took off her mask and gloves, and then tossed the white lab coat into the room next door. When she looked around, she noticed a man standing at the door to the operating room. He was talking to a nurse excitedly. I'm so excited. Oh my god, I'm so lucky. Really, I'm really too lucky, this is a whole bus of people we're talking about. The bus even rolled over, and everyone is injured, but not me. Look at me, I didn't even get a scratch. The nurse said, yes, okay, sir, we understand, but I'd still suggest that you have a full body examination done. After all, there could still be many internal injuries. The man patted his chest. No way, I really am fine. There's nothing wrong with me at all. Look at me, look at how energetic I am. I am the luckiest person on earth. As the man spoke, he began to turn on the spot. Nora had initially taken notice of the man because of his behavior, but the very moment he turned around, Nora suddenly froze. Because, there was a mole on the side of the man's face, and there was even a strand of hair on the mole. When one connected this to the reason why Nora had come to the hospital, she narrowed her eyes. Suddenly, she took a step forward and patted the man on the shoulder. The man turned around. Nora narrowed her eyes and stared at him. What a coincidence, Charles. Chapter 659 I'm sorry, Ms. Yvette. Charles was stunned. Then, he said excitedly, you know me. Young Missy, how come you know me? How did you know my name is Charles? Ha ha, do you know? I was really lucky today. The bus overturned, and everyone in it was injured, but I didn't suffer even a scratch. I must have saved the world in my previous life. For the 50-year-old to say such things, Nora couldn't help but find it rather odd. Many older people, even if they surfed the internet a lot, rarely said such things in real life. She frowned. Do you know who I am? Charles didn't seem surprised at all. It doesn't matter who you are. Isn't what matters the fact that I dodged the bullet today. Do you know how dangerous it was? The bus, brakes had suddenly failed and it was rushing straight toward a mountain in front of us, you know. The woman in front of me was screaming the whole time in fear, and even I thought that I was dead meat. But unexpectedly, even though the bus overturned, I turned out fine. Nora frowned upon hearing his description of what had happened. How are you okay? Charles replied, I don't know. I was just very fortunate. The bus overturned and quite a few people died on the spot. Did you see? You don't. Even have to try saving a few of those people who were pushed in just now, sigh, do you know? His expression turned a little nostalgic. I am actually not a good person. Of course, I am not a bad person either. I just did some bad things back in the day and helped some bad people in the past. Over the years, I have been devoting myself to God. And look, results are showing. God must have been watching over me this time, that's why I managed to escape. The more he talked, the more excited he became. He actually looked a little like he was going to cry bitterly. He said, after I go back, I must be even more pious. I shall donate all my money to the church. None of the other nurses were paying attention to him. In addition, seemingly because he had met Nora, someone who was willing to listen, he was very excited. Nora looked at him in silence. No wonder Jessica had said he was a lunatic. There was indeed something wrong with his mental health, and he seemed crazy. She lowered her eyes and slowly asked, how much money do you have? The man suddenly lowered his voice, but it seemed like he couldn't quite control his volume. 
Thus, even though he had lowered his voice, he was actually still very loud. He said, don't be fooled by my ordinary clothes. I am no ordinary man. I have a lot of money. I used to work for a very impressive person. More than 20 years ago, she even paid me up to $15,000 a month. $15,000 a month, you know. Do you know how much $15,000 was worth over 20 years ago? It was worth even more than $150,000 today. I was really basking in the limelight back then. Charles seemed caught in his memories. He said, after that, I earned a whole lot of money, but I didn't dare to spend it. I would have felt guilty if I were to spend that money. He burst into tears and said, I have $5 million, but I hid the cash at home. I didn't dare to spend it, you know. But after this accident, I've sorted out my thoughts. You know how a person would have epiphanies at near-death moments. Why didn't I dare to spend that money? All that money belongs to me. Nora frowned. Even if her mother had given him $15,000 a month, that would only amount to $180,000 a year. For him to have $5 million, he would have had to work for 30 years. Yet, as far as she knew, after her mother passed away, she hadn't given those three people any more money. So, how would Charles possibly have $5 million in cash? Also, why was he saying that he dared not spend the money? Where had that money come from? Were they benefit that her mother had given these people, who had worked under her for years? But if that was the case, why didn't old Maddie receive any? She frowned and asked, who gave you the money? Charles glanced at her and then chuckled. I can't tell you that, young Missy, I can't. I went against my conscience for that money, so I can't tell you, sigh. He went against his conscience for that money. Nora narrowed her eyes. At this moment, the family members of the victims had all reached the hospital. Some rushed over to the operating rooms while some rushed over to the bodies of the people, who had been pronounced dead, and started to cry bitterly. All of a sudden, the hospital became a mess again. When Nora was about to ask Charles about something, a voice came over. Charles, are you okay? She turned to see a 50-year-old man approaching them. He was standing in front of Charles and looking him up and down. You don't have any family, so they called me instead. Charles replied, what can happen to me? I'm fine, I'm totally fine. Bro, let me tell you, I was really very lucky today. Charles then started to recount in detail again what had happened that day. Nora, the man was seriously neurotic. She rolled her eyes and walked up to the two of them. Just when she was about to ask something, Charles's friend suddenly said, Okay, okay, I get it. I know you went through life and death today, you are so lucky. But why are you suddenly so chatty? Nora paused and looked at the two men abruptly. Charles was still babbling on and on neurotically. Because I'm agitated and excited. I thought I could only be a stevedore for the rest of my life. Did you know? I thought that I didn't deserve happiness anymore. I thought I could only be like you for the rest of my life, only be a laborer. His friend's expression changed. What do you mean by that? Who are you looking down on? Charles was still babbling. In fact, he had even started crying, as if the emotions that he had kept suppressed for a long time were finally erupting. He said, Stevedores, of course. Not only is the work tiring, but the pay is also so low. You guys may be uncultured, but do you know who I am? I graduated from Hamlin School of Medicine, you know. The Hamlin School of Medicine. Nora narrowed her eyes. His colleague, however, had never heard of the school. What are you going crazy for? You must have hit your head, right? Why are you acting so weird today? Never mind being chatty, but you're even suddenly talking about a medical school. If you were a high-achieving student, would you have been working as a laborer with us? Charles waved dismissively and said, Yeah, I'm different from you people. So you see, God still cares for me. Even when I was in a traffic accident, I didn't get hurt at all. Nora's heart suddenly sank as she listened to their conversation. She took a big step forward and suddenly asked, Excuse me, is he usually very quiet? Charles's colleague nodded. Yeah, Ramsey talks very little. It's rare for him to be this excited. It must have gone to his head. As soon as he said that, Nora grabbed Charles's hand. 
she suddenly shouted at the doctor beside them, arrange a CT scan for him immediately. The doctor was stunned. What? The man looked at Charles carefully. But he doesn't seem injured. Charles also said, yeah, I am not injured. I'm not doing a CT scan. Are you a doctor? You just want my money, right? As soon as he said that, Nora looked at him seriously with an awful look on her face. She said, you graduated from medical school, right? Then let me ask you this, what are the symptoms of intracerebral hemorrhage? Intracerebral hemorrhage, Charles subconsciously answered, excessive secretion of adrenaline, causing people to become overly excited. After that, they will bleed from their seven orifices. At this point, he suddenly realized something. Norris' expression became even more serious. Yes, that's right. If there was too great a change in Charles's personality, then he must be suffering a hemorrhage in the brain. Internal bleeding was a very serious condition. There was a high chance that it would block blood vessels and form congestions. By the time it was discovered, it would be too late for diagnosis and treatment. Nora hadn't immediately discovered Charles's abnormal behavior because she thought that he was a madman. After all, according to Jessica's description, Charles was a madman. But through the chat with his colleague, one would know that he was usually not like this. It was only with his colleague's description of him as a taciturn man that it fit the personality of the man who had called her. That was how she had suddenly realized Charles's abnormal behavior. The doctor next to them, however, frowned. Who are you? Why should I arrange a brain CT for him? Don't you know that people who undergo CT scans are exposed to radiation? It's best that healthy people not do it. After he said that, Nora immediately said, I am anti. The doctor shut up at once and looked at Charles. Then, he suddenly picked up his cell phone and called the CT department upstairs to make arrangements for the man to jump the line. Nora looked at Charles again. Charles was dumbfounded. He touched his head. At this point, he could faintly feel something warm trickling out of his nose. He touched it and found that it was blood. Only then did he realize something. His eyes widened at once and he suddenly said, I get it, I get it now. It's them. They are here to silence me. Nora clutched his wrist tightly. Tell me, who is trying to silence you? The mysterious organization. Upon hearing the words, mysterious organization, at last, Charles focused and looked at Nora. In his state of excitement just now, after grabbing Nora, he had immediately started chatting with her. He hadn't noticed Nora's looks at all. But in this very instant, he saw Nora's face clearly. Her face was 90% similar to Yvette's back then. His eyes widened suddenly. Ms. Yvette. Nora's eyes flickered faintly with a sharp glint. I am Nora Smith. Nora Smith. The name made Charles's pupils shrink. He subconsciously said, you look so much like Ms. Yvette now that you've lost weight. After she lost weight, this meant that Charles had definitely seen her a few years ago. Was it when she was pregnant? Had her mother gotten him to set up her pregnancy? The thoughts flooded into her mind. However, Nora found that Charles's pupils were starting to dilate. There was no time for her to ask all the questions she wanted to ask. She could only ask one of them, tell me, did I have twins or triplets back then? Charles's eyes were starting to lose focus, as though he could no longer think straight. He stared at Nora blankly. Twins or triplets? His eyes suddenly reddened and he said, Ms. Nora, I've let you down. I betrayed you back then, and also betrayed Ms. Yvette, for so many years, I have felt guilty about this. But that was not what Nora wanted to hear. She asked again, tell me, was I pregnant with twins or triplets? Charles's eyes were red. He suddenly smiled and said, yeah, the mysterious organization threatened me and bribed me. They gave me five million dollars, but because I betrayed Ms. Yvette, I have never spent that money all these years. I'm sorry, I plotted against you. I am going to repay your kindness now. They wanted to silence me, but they didn't expect that I would meet you before my death. However, what he said next made Nora's eyes widen in disbelief, yet also with enlightenment. Thanks. Like and subscribe before.